Hello, everybody. My name is Lag Spike, and today I'm joined with uh, esteemed co-host Zoran. Hello. Uh, so, uh, if you if you are, weren't on his channel recently, then you probably don't know what's going on. But if you were, you'll know that we recently did a uh, Fire Emblem Fates all of the tier one skills. We ranked them all in terms of how good they are. Today uh, on my channel, we're going to be doing the tier two skills, which is a lot more because you know you can promote it to two different things. Um, we're going to be ranking these from meta-defining to bad. Uh, we went through a lot of skills last time, and we're going to go through a lot of, even more skills this time. And uh, I'm actually pretty excited. Um, uh, if you guys don't know, but uh, right before we get started, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of background on Zora. And if for some ungodly reason you're, you're somehow subscribed to me and not subscribed to him, um, he makes a lot of Fire Emblem Fates content, just like I do. Uh, he does a lot more scripted. He does scripted stuff, um, specific chapter clear, strategy-based stuff, just like I do. Um, there's a lot, uh, I mean, he, but he's been doing it for a lot longer than I have, so, uh, he's a lot more experienced in it. A lot of my channels, ex um, a lot of my uh, influence was actually from him, and I, um, and it's, it's great for me to be able to do this. I can't wait to get started on this. Yeah, looking forward to it. Alright, um, sadly we're gonna have to start things off on a pretty sour note. We're gonna have to start off with, um, Dragon Lord. Um, if you don't know what Dragon Lord is... Don't worry, neither do I. Let me look this up real quick. I know. Uh, it's a luck percent chance of having the damage taken by an adjacent ally. That is true. Uh, luck point... Lu, lu, it's actually luck point five. Oh, uh, luck half luck, luck percent. So, oh my god. Yeah, half luck is pretty bad. It's not even like miraculous save, and even miraculous save is pretty bad. Um, I don't think we need to talk about... Talk, enough, talk that much to explain why this skill is not that great. It's mostly available in routes where you already have a lot of other ways of um, negating, uh, like negating or um, mitigating the way uh, the amount of damage you take. Like, you know, you can just be running insane dodge tank skills in Rev, and in Birthright the enemies are not that strong. Yeah, to uh, be clear, this is on Hoshido Noble, so it's not accessible in Conquest at all. Mm hmm. It's a uh, level 5 skill, at least, so it's accessible easy. And, but, again, adjacent, like, uh, skills that require you to be adjacent, even in, even in Fates, it's not that great. Like, unless it's really good, it's not the greatest thing to have. Um, especially when you're on enemy face. But, um, yeah, I just don't see it being that good. It's, it doesn't require you to be about to die like Miracle. So I'd say I'd put it in, like, niche, but I wouldn't, but I don't think it deserves to be anywhere higher than niche. Um... Yeah, it's a lot worse than the the damage reduction skills for adjacent units that are just fixed damage, uh, just because you can't ever really rely on this, and especially if it's luck over 2%, there's just no way you can stack that enough to get reasonably good proc rates all the time. And it's, it's one of those things that would work a lot better if you could use it over and over again on enemy phase, but what, you're really not putting a bunch of units adjacent to each other for the most part for enemy phase combat, especially not on Birthright. Um, and if you are, then you have plenty of ways to handle that better than trying to take advantage of Dragon Ward. So I'd call it maybe niche, but at the bottom of niche. I'm completely willing to put it, that, uh, put it over there. The way I see it is that it's the proc rate is obviously worse than miracle, but it doesn't require you to like rely on it or you're gonna die. You either rely on it or you take a hefty chunk of damage. Yeah. And that's that's a that's a reasonable risk reward ratio if you can set it up properly. Yeah, it's it's yet another skill that can sometimes improve your action economy. It just doesn't do that very well. Yeah. Now we move on to uh Hoshin Unity. Uh this is a just straight up plus ten percent proc rate to skills. Um, which is pretty good. I mean it's really good for skills that have low proc rate, like, I mean, I guess lethality, but not re I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more around, along the lines of, like, Astra, where, like, a plus, uh, having your, Astra is basically a guaranteed survive, guaranteed, you're going to live this combat, you're going to kill the enemy, and you're not going to die in the next combat because you're going to get a shield gauge off of it, and having an extra 10% chance to do that, if you can, it makes your stacking a lot easier, like, Relying on skills to activate in every combat is bad, but if you need to activate it like two out of seven combats and you have a high enough stat for it to be likely, then like you can you can do skill stuff in this game. It's just you need to know what you're doing. And I think that uh, 
host and unity can be a pretty uh, easy way of making things easier on you. And it also, it is a level 15 promoted skill, but uh, the, the, the point in time where you're going to have enough stats to make use of proc skills that consistently is going to be that close to that game. So I don't think that is something that hampers it that much. Yeah, I think the, the issue with offensive procs in this game is just that the, the value of an offensive proc is inversely related with your ability to just kill things straight up with your regular listed damage. And because there are so many ways to just stack pure offensive stats in Fates, most of the time if you're putting a lot of effort into like, putting together a huge proc stacking build, you can be a lot more effective if you just go and pick up damage boosting skills instead. Um, Hoshid and Unity does affect other kinds of procs, like uh, Miracle famously with Miracle Midori, and um, even the like out of combat ones like Salvage Blow and Profiteer. Uh, and those are those are fine, but it's it's really hard to combine it with those things. Um, so I would say Hoshid and Unity's sounds better than it really is. Like, I would probably call it niche as well, and maybe actually a little bit worse than Duelist Blow, because it's, again, it's a thing that improves your combat efficiency a little bit some of the time, um, so which translates into more actions that you get some of the time. Uh, but Duelist Blow works for the whole game, almost. You get, like, samurai who can sometimes benefit up from it early on, whereas Hoshiden Unity is an endgame thing. And if you're combining it with a whole bunch of offensive procs, you could have invested in other builds that are even more effective and don't rely on chances. I, I think you might be thinking of this, like, I agree that it's not great, but I think you might be thinking of this in the wrong terms. The way I'm putting it, uh, Hoshin Unity is not, you have a 10% more chance of procking a skill that's going to have an effect that kills an enemy. The way I see it is that Hoshin Unity is going to give you a 10% more chance to proc a skill that's going to keep you alive easier in the enemy phase. So that means Astra and Soul. That's what I'm. That's basically what I'm going for here. Soul means that you heal. Astra means you get shield gauge. And I think that means that you're. Ha I think it, adding more reliability to your enemy phase, especially when you're up against you know Brave Lance, enemy generals, you know Tomahawk, Berserker, stuff like that. Especially with like you know certain blow inspiration. You see stuff like that in Chapter 26. Well, well, it's Hoshin Unity. Never mind. Well, even then, uh, Red Endgame has enemies with just insanely high stats and. The ability to guarantee yourself at least a little bit more reliability under any circumstances, I think, has some value to it. Though I don't think it's going to put it into like like always worthwhile or meta defining. I think I would put it in the bottom of nice to have personally. Uh, I think you might be overestimating the uh, the reliability of those more defensive proc skills like Astra and Soul, even if you do have Hoshin and Unity with them. Um, but it is it is a thing that it is a combination you can set up. It just it's level 15, corn exclusive, or and also corn's kids. It, it just doesn't work for very long, even if you do yeah, get that you combo. Know now that I think about like the limited limited availability, you're right. Um, I think I want to put it over Dragon Fang, though. Yeah, the one thing I see for Dragon Fang is it has specific niches if you want to get like late game boss kills. Specifically for Takumi at Conquest Endgame, like if you're willing to chance it, it does let you, it does make your build for that a lot more flexible. Yeah. Um, okay. You know what? You're right. On, I'm not gonna fight you on Hoshin Unity. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not be ridiculous here. Yeah. Okay. That's not the that's not the hill that I'm gonna die on today. Um, let's let's let you talk about Draconic Hex because I have some interesting ideas about it. Um. Yeah. I like Draconic Hex. Um. I think it's it can be a useful skill and. Yes, the, your ideal outcome for combat is generally just to kill everything you fight, and, and you want to... Uh, what Draconic Hex does is it weakens all the enemies who end up fighting Corrin or Kana or whoever. Um, but there are a reasonable number of situations where like, Corrin can miss a counterattack, or you can get attacked from outside... Um, your range so you can't counter or they're just some difficult bosses and if you know if corn tries for the kill and fails or if corn's not gonna be able to one round anyway then you can uh, cripple them and you don't have to rely on the 
accuracy of, a, of an enfeeble staff or anything like that. So it's, it's a consistent way to debuff enemies in a big way, and that can be helpful. Uh, I would tend to put it towards the upper half of nice to have, like maybe a little bit better than nobility. The catch for Draconic Hex is that uh, you do have to stick through Nor Noble, and sometimes that's not very compatible with other plans you might have for Corn, especially if Corn's going into other classes to pick up some of the really strong early skills like Elbow Room or Malefic Aura or Strength Plus Two and Lunge off Wyvern Rider. Or Quick Draw or Strong Opposed Heart Seeker, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think that. Um... I absolutely agree with your assessment on Draconic or uh, a Draconic Hex. It's it's something that entirely depends on how flexible your build is. Like, if you're able to comfortably rush promotion, uh, get to level five as quickly as possible, then your corn is going to be a kill setup beast. Because uh, I, again, I told you about this in the earlier video. I had a Iron Man where I went through all Fates games. Um, uh, in Conquest and Birthright, I had Draconic Hex, and dear god, man, is Draconic Hex good at, like, just letting you set up kills and just letting you make things more reliable. It's, it's the, it's the sleeper hit of the Fates Clash, but, but the situation that I was in is obviously not achievable outside of, you know, spawning stuff in, so I don't think we should count it. I do agree with it being around nobility aptitude level. Um, I think putting it above aptitude is the play. Seems fair. Now we come to... Uh, this is a weird skill. Um, Norian Trust. It gives you the um, proc skills of whoever's in your backpack. Yeah, I believe specifically the combat activated ones. So like you can't get salvage blow off of, the, off of your support unit. I'm, ba I'm like kind of ashamed to admit that I've made use of this. <laughs> um, I once had a parry that had a that had soul in the backpack. She was my only other unit left on like a turn of endgame. Um, and then Korn got a soul off of her accidentally, and then he survived, which is pretty funny. But um, basically, with no with uh, Norian Trust, what you're saying is. I don't- the number of skill slots I have is not enough for the number of proc skills I want to run. Give me some more skill slots. Um, and that's just a really dumb statement because, like, I, the, I only like Astra and Soul. Those are the only proc skills I will ever use. And that's two slots. One of those skills is on a Hoshin class and one of those skills is on a Norian class. So how much of an issue do you have in getting more proc skills in your skill set that you need to have a specific skill dedicated to getting you more proc skills? And it's a level 15 promoted skill on a class that's not even that good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's only one sort of... There's one use case I can think of where Norian Trust is kind of handy and that's if you're going for like a Dragonstone Kana build, and you want her to get, or him or her to get, like, soul or something off of her spouse for free, um, which can happen sometimes. Um, where So Kana doesn't have to specifically go through Hero to get it. Um, Corrin can do the same thing, but I think Corrin's generally destined for better things than sticking with Nor Noble for the whole game. Um, like, it can be kind of neat in that respect, just to like pick up one of those skills without actually, in effect, without actually having to go get it. Um, but it's it's kind of like Hoshida and Unity in that you're focusing on the wrong thing if you're trying to make the most out of Norian Trust. You just really don't need offensive proc stacking, and if you're going for it, you could have spent all that time just stacking damage instead, and you would have consistent kill power and and not be relying on chances. Um, um, I think I think it's even worse than I think it's worse than Hoshin Unity. I think it's worse than uh, I, I definitely think it's worse than Dragon Ward. Actually, yeah, no, I think it's worse than Dragon Ward. I, mm, I don't think it's worse than Dragon Ward, honestly. Um, yeah, I guess I guess it's not really because Dragon Ward is really bad. Yeah, I, I would at least put it ahead of Luck Plus Four. Um, 
I could see it going higher, just depending on like if you're able to make use of. Why is good fortune this high? Oh my god! Wait, no, no, no. That's because that's because we, you you like the. I mean, it's it's not like it's gonna hurt you. Yeah, right? it gives you free healing. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, that that Can seems like an okay spot. Dragon. Can we agree to drop Dragon Ward down a tier because it hurts me to see niche because, uh, like, what niche? If, yeah, if you want to put it at the top of bad, I think that's fine too. Let's move on to uh, Astra. I actually have a lot of things to say about Astra. I think I like it more than the average person, and um, it's really just because of the shield gauge it gives. So Astra is basically, I think it's uh, skill divided by 5%. Uh, let me see. Skill over 2. Alright, divided by 2. Right. Um, yeah, skill divided by 2% to deal, uh, attack five times at half damage. So, the important part isn't the damage dealing, it's more that every time you attack, you get shield gauge. And relying on Astro to survive is not good, but let's say, okay, let me posit an example. Let's say you have a pretty bulky unit, right? You have a pretty bulky unit. Let's say, I don't know, you're in Rev, you, you gave Xandra Astra, he's still in Swordmaster because you wanted some extra speed without have without having to like uh, make sure you can get the speed and give him a different para partner and not have to worry about it too much or something. Um, Xander is still really bulky because you know he has good defense and also he has his sword that gives him more defense. Um, he also has pretty solid skill because Swordmaster has pretty solid skill. Xander has pretty solid skill. Um, what he's gonna have is basically he's gonna have like a 15 uh, 15 percent chance at, at like 10 to 15 percent chance every single combat to kill the enemy get a free shield gauge. And for the most part, Xander already isn't dying. There's no way he's almost never dying. He's just taking chip damage. And what Astra means is that every every other combat, like every couple every couple of combats or so, Xander basically instead of taking chip damage, he doesn't take chip damage and he kills the enemy. And um, you know you get more chances for this uh, before the enemy attacks because uh, it also comes in the same line as Vantage. Yada yada yada. You know, um, you can get stuff like that. I, I think that it's a great way of uh, slightly uh, increasing reliability for tanking on a unit that's already somewhat bulky, but could use that little bit of edge to get them to the point where they're really hard to kill or basically impossible to kill. Uh, yeah, Astra works great on a character who already has incredible combat stats. Um, if they're already capable of fighting a bunch of enemies, so that you're not really relying on Astra to save their butt all the time, um, then it it works pretty well. Um, it helps that it comes along with Vantage, so if you've got a good 1-2 range combat unit who's going through Swordmaster and picking up Astra, um, they can use... What, what can happen is, if they don't have a full shield gauge and their va Vantage is active, they can... They have a chance to proc Astra before the enemy even attacks. And then they'll likely either kill the enemy or at least fill up their own guard gauge, probably both. Um, though I should say, uh, you're probably not going to get all five extra... Like, you're probably not going to get ten full shields out of Astra activating. Um, because there, are, in a lot of cases, you'll either already have your guard gauge partially filled or you'll crit on one of the earlier hits of Astra and kill them, cutting it off early. Um, so it's not necessarily going to just automatically fill your guard gauge all the time, every time. Um, but it is nice in that respect. And um, it does make Ryoma noticeably tankier than he otherwise would be. Um, if you're reckless with Ryoma, he can still certainly die because, uh, you know, like... This is a low percent chance of happening, and he actually doesn't have amazing defenses. Um, but it's a nice skill on a character who already has great combat. Um, I would probably call Astra high end of nice to have, a little bit worse than Vantage itself. You might disagree with me on that. Oh, I would put it below. I would personally put it below uh, Demzel. Okay. Because the way I see it is that Astra, you get it, you get it kind of middle of the game, and it's also not useful on every unit. So, whereas Demazel is useful for a significant part of your army, and it's really useful in the early game. <laughs> uh, 
Now we come to Sword Fair. I'm just going to put all the sword... I'm just, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that all of the fair skills are in at least always worthwhile. The, the only thing that's keeping them not out of, out of meta defining is the fact that they're level 15 promoted skills, as they should be, because plus 5 damage is stupid. Now, uh, for some Awakening players, uh, keep in mind that Fair skills actually don't work like they do in Awakening. In Awakening, if you equip the fair, like the if you had Tome Fair and you equip the Tome, you got plus five magic visible. It, it, you just deal five more damage, so you can't get like extra staff range. Well, it's not like you get extra staff range anyway. It's fixed range on staff, but you know you don't get extra like visible stats from uh, having fair skill. Yeah, they also don't affect attack direct the listed attack directly, which interacts with a couple things like Dragon Fang and. Uh, in a less optimal way. Um, I think the weapon fairs might very well all end up in always worthwhile. I probably wouldn't, I don't think I would put any up in meta defining. And I think there are distinctions to be made between the different weapon types. So we should probably go through them each individually. Um, yeah, but I'm just saying they're all good. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're never going to stay in Swordmaster until level 15 and be like, ah, sword fair? What the hell am I going to use this piece of crap for? No, you're going to use it. Yeah, and probably if you're a, if you're using that weapon type, then it's often a good idea to go out of your way to pick it up, pick up the appropriate weapon fare. Um, it's money wise, even if you spend two seals on it, it can often be more efficient to do that than to like forge a really big iron weapon or something. Yeah, um, I think I'm putting it. I think I want to put it either below or above HP plus five. Um, for Swordfare specifically, um, it's really amazing on Ryoma when he gets it, and on Xander if he can get it in Rev. Uh, most other characters can't really make use of 1-2 range swords, so you don't get nearly as much mileage out of this. I guess it's uh, useful in Korn because the Yato is good against Dragon Skin. Um, it can be helpful there. Um, and if you're a Leaven Sword user, which there are precious few good ones in the game is basically just corn and maybe Kana. I mean, I mean a couple... if you give Leo an arm scroll, he can make use of it, but it's kind of stupid. But, I mean, you can do it. Yeah, you can. I mean, the Leaven Sword is like an Eleven Might tome, essentially, which is more than average. <laughs> it's like one Might more than the Brin Hilder. Uh, it does get more Might bonuses from weapon ranks than tomes do, but yeah. uh, other than that, yeah, it's not... It's not hugely useful, except specifically on Korin, Xander, and uh, Xander and Ryoma, and potentially like Kana. Um, other characters, like, there is the Kodachi and Birthright, um, but it's just not that great an enemy phase weapon. Um, <laughs> you also got it in Conquest, but it's even worse there. Yeah, um, the, phys the the normal physical one-two weapons. Uh, aren't amazing at enemy phase combat, but I think even among those, the Hand Axe and the Javelin are both more effective than the Kodachi is. I don't know about the Hand Axe and Javelin, definitely, though. Like, well, I guess it's just my my experience of the Hand Axe has just been tainted by using it with Arthur, and he's just a such garbage hit rate. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think right around the level of Magic Plus 2, I, I kind of like where you're sticking it now, between HP Plus 5 and Magic Plus 2. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, wait, I was gonna... You know what? I was gonna say something. Oh yeah, no. Um, if you if you can get if you can get lucky and get a, a couple of umbrellas or parasols, then sword fair is worth using. Cause oh maybe, um, umbrella is basically like the world's most discount Raijinto you will ever see. But even a discount Raijinto is pretty good. Like I I once had an umbrella plus two and I used the hell out of that thing. Um, yeah, if you've got a really strong unit, um, you can you can or like a. A really big forge and one of the joke weapons they can be pretty effective sometimes yeah i did that with i think i've done it with like parry well because she just has big strength or charlotte yeah anyways moving on to seal strength this is master of arms level five um seal strength i don't know my seal strength man we all know you're going into master like don't try to pretend you're not going into master arms to get life and death advantage so let's just like get our pretenses out of the way. Seal Strength increases your bulk, and that's not what you're after, so why bother pretending like it's worthwhile, like, right? That, that's basically where I stand with it. I just think it's not that great. The, like, Seal skills are not already not that good on your units, 
because you can't really throw away your unit's turns to just reduce an enemy stats, a, a one enemy stats, unless that enemy is the boss, because you're usually outnumbered. But with seal strength, especially being a level five promoted, there's only uh, there's only a few level five promoted uh, seal skills. There's seal strength over here, seal magic over here, and where's seal speed? Seal speed. Where's where's lance fair? And seal speed over here. Those are the only ones. So, uh, and like. Uh, and all three of them, I think, are kind of meh. And Seal Strength especially, because it doesn't even align with the goals of what you're trying to do in Master of Arms. Yeah, from the player's side, the main thing that the Seal skill, seal Skills do for you, outside of you know, weakening bosses, like we discussed with Draconic Hex, uh, is they activate on enemies who... For the most part, they're going to activate on enemies who attacked you on enemy phase and who you couldn't kill. So... If you're cutting their strength after that point for the following player phase, that's not that useful to you because the main thing, the only thing you really want to do at that point is just go kill them. Uh, and cutting their strength is not really going to help you do that on your player phase. So, seal strength, I would say. Uh, yeah, towards the bottom of niche, really. Um, like, it, it can certainly help you, and it is consistent, so you can, like, use it in ways that are helpful. It's just, most of the time, the ways you can use it are not nearly as good as other things you could be doing. I think it's really just held back by the fact that it's a Master of Arms skill. At least in, uh, for example, Dark Knight, where you get Dark Magic, you have, uh, where you get Seal Magic, you have access to 1-2 to two range, so you can not only hit them with a Seal Magic, you can also attack them back, and... Get, get a good chance of either weakening to the point where you can two round them if you need to. Sure. Uh, life and death. I haven't used life and death enough to comment on this. I'm just going to leave it to you. Yeah, this is... The placement for this, I think, is sort of informed by the way we've designed these tiers, where like it, it's definitely true that you can combine life and death with a couple other things to make really really stupid builds that essentially break the game because nothing can attack you and you just kill them all um but it's actively bad for you on a lot of like you can't just put life and death on anyone it's sounds sounds good on like maybe stick it on an archer or something and say well they're just attacking on player phase and therefore, like, plus 10 damage and attacking outside the enemy counterattack range is great. Oh, where, where did you get that one? Chapter 23 of Conquest? <laughs> but... If you... It's just... It's more painful than you might expect. Like, I've done runs where have, like, had, for example, had Kaze pass life and death to Midori or something. And, and thought, <laughs> oh, like, plus 10 damage for Midori with her bows or daggers or whatever, that'll be great. <laughs> And it just becomes really annoying because there are lots of occasions where you want to bait enemies at the at the far end of their range with a bow or something. And with life and death, that becomes a lot more difficult. Um, yeah. So I think I would actually put this at the top of niche, where like it's insanely strong. You can definitely put it for to to good use in specific situations. And there are combinations with life and death and other skills like vantage and Trample and Malefic Aura and 1-2 range that are really broken, but it's just not by itself going to help you in a lot of cases. Man, Life and Death is such a weird skill. Honestly, I feel like we might need to put a new tier for it because the issue is, like, if you get Life and Death, you probably, like, you probably know that you want to do the dumb, stupid, super unit, kill everybody in one hit for fun build and <clears throat> at that point in that build life and death is the linchpin like it is the absolutely is the thing yes. that makes that build work but if you're not doing that build it's dog shit like you're never going to use it uh, like it could go into always worthwhile because if you're using that build then it's always going to be worthwhile but if you're not using that build it's it's just bad well it's not bad it's niche because again on archers then you're going to do it i mean Chapter 23 Conquest has these extremely dumb counter life and death snipers where if you hit them in one hit and you don't kill them, then they do, do all of your health in one hit. But uh, I digress. Um, yeah, I think I would put it in... Uh, I think, yeah, I guess niche, top of niche is the best place to put it, but 
It just doesn't. It just doesn't describe everything that the skill is, but yeah, I think it's just the best thing to do. <laughs> Alright. Profiteer. Alright, uh, no, I need to talk about this. So, on at least three separate Iron Man runs, I have tried to make Profiteer work on Midori. It doesn't work. It's just not worth the amount of money that you need to put into it to make it consistent. It's the first seven turns, you have a luck percent chance to get a gold bar. Gold bar is 300 gold. That's pretty solid. Um... But the thing is, to make the luck percent like possible, you need to use basically you basically need to use Midori because she gets a plus twenty percent to all her luck percent stuff, and that's that's that makes it a lot easier to do. And, but then after that, you need to stack so much stuff. You can't dance. You can only activate this once per turn on your first turn. So if you get a gold bar, you can't dance and then do something and then roll for a gold bar again. You're not gonna get that gold bar. You need to get like you can, you have to stack like you know rally luck inspiring song uh midori's luck like plus 20 percent just midori's naturally high luck add luck plus four on top of that with like a zura midori do some other dumb shit like that and then after that you have a kind of okay chance of getting 2100 gold and then you already spent like another 200 gold to get a, a luck tonic to make sure that she got a higher chance it's just it's just too much headache for too little values the way i'd put it like Gold bars, you get enough gold, like, if you're think, saying that, I want more gold bars because I want to use them for spendthrift, you get enough gold bars in the campaign. Don't try to kid yourself, alright? If you're if you're using spendthrift, you are probably not going to be using spendthrift all the time. You're probably going to use it two times, and both the times are, 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 and you get enough gold bars to make it work. So, you can just feed Lilith food and she'll give you gold bars, like, whatever. It's, it's just, it's not necessary, and I, I think, I, I think... I think I would put it exactly in the middle of nice to, nice to have because if you just treat it as I have an empty skill slot, I'm just gonna put the skill here. Sometimes I'll get more free money than fair, but otherwise I just no. Um. Yeah, I think like Midori is definitely the person who can use uh, Profiteer the best, just because out of the box when you're getting her, she can have about a forty percent chance to activate it, which. Uh, the mechanics of this are a little bit wonky. Uh, you, can, you can't activate Profiteer if you are the support unit in pair-up. You have to be the person who's acting to end their turn. But there are some things that you wouldn't expect would count for that that do. Like, if Midori is by herself and she pairs up with someone, she can activate Profiteer uh, upon pairing up because she's ended her turn herself. Um, it's a little bit weird. There are a couple other edge cases like that. So basically, you're rolling Midori about 40%, everyone else who gets this about 20%, give or take. More once you get later in the game. Uh, chance every turn to get a gold bar. So that works out to, um, in Midori's case, um, between two and three gold bars every map most of the time. And that's nice. Uh, so you can... You can get, depending on how many paralogs you're doing and invasions and how many chapters you have left, you could conceivably get um, several thousand gold out of that, which is useful always. I wouldn't specifically try to stack luck to make this work. Like, if you're trying to combine luck plus four and a luck tonic and like rally luck to make profit here, generate you more money for you. I mean, you can do that. It's just not really worth thinking about. There is enough money in every route for you to get by without specifically trying to use Profiteer to raise revenue. Um, but it is certainly like a useful filler skill once you pick it up in the middle of the game. Um, I, I like promoting Midori to, to Merchant over Mechanist. Um, and if you do that, then she does get Profiteer essentially for free, especially if you recruit her after chapter 20. And it can be accessed fairly easily by a couple other characters. Um, if for some reason you're sticking with Villager Mozu, I think Merchant is her best promotion. Um, and like you, you can go like Merchant Azama and stuff like that. Um... Oh, we can't forget Seno. Merchant Seno, of course. Merchant Seno, yes. 
Uh, yeah, I, I guess by the standards we have for our tiers, it, I would put it like sort of middle to low end of nice to have. It's certainly something I wouldn't regret getting, uh, but I, I don't think you should like take your take one of your units and like try to get access to merchant so that you can go get profiteer and then go do change to something else. I think I think I want to put it below swap. That seems fair. Okay. Um. Now we come to Spendthrift, which is, oh my god, which is, like, the most niche skill. It's plus 10 damage dealt and minus 10 damage taken if you initiate and you have a gold bar in your inventory and it spends that gold bar. This is the, like, this is the most made-for-enemy skill in the entire universe, aside from the skills that you quite literally can't get on player units. This skill is unreasonably annoying to deal with when it's on an enemy and when you have it you're like what am i gonna do with this piece of garbage makes invasion 2 and conquest very spicy oh yeah invasion 2 chapter 12 <clears throat> and chapter 27 those are the three chapters that you need to watch out for the skill on um it's i think yukimura it's... has it in chapter 22 as well yeah but yukimura i mean he's a mechanist so he's a pretty easy kill basically is where i land with it <laughs> Um, basically, you, you're going to... Supplying it is not super difficult, right? You can get reasonably get one every couple of chapters by just f making sure you feed Lilith and not take, not doing, like, seven chapters in one day. If you, like, you know, take your time, you know, every couple days you do it. Every every day you do, like, a chapter or two. Then uh, you could probably get a couple of, uh, couple of gold bars. But... There's there are very few situations where I would take this over just the 300 gold because the the usage the use case of this is why I'm what I'm saying is that I, this is this is this is actually you know what this is definitely this is this is actually what I'm saying what I'm saying is that I'm not smart enough of, of a player to make proper use of the skill and if I'm not smart enough of a player then I'm just gonna choose to believe that nobody else is either so that's why I feel like the skill is bad. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it bad if I wouldn't put it in the bottom tier. Um, like it's, it's definitely, definitely has its purposes. Um, they're one, one of the freer Takami killers you can get is like Camilla Midori who inherits Trample and, uh, I, I forget, I don't think you need to pass life and death down from Kaze, but like you can recruit her right at the end of the game and get her like trample and and then uh offspring seal her through merchant to get spendthrift and take the crescent bow and go kill takami pretty much guaranteed um so it, it's it's nice for some specific bosses uh i think it's a giant pain to, to keep it supplied if you're trying to use this over and over again and it is it's a player phase only skill and it does eat up your gold bars and yes, you you'll get enough gold bars to to feed this if you want for specific kills. And it is in the class with profiteer, so you can generate more gold bars that way as well. Uh, but frankly, it's unnecessary for most combat, and it's makes for some kind of annoying inventory management. Um, I'd probably call it slightly better than Dragon Fang, probably. Um, yeah, I mean, we all know the bosses that you can use this on. You're probably going to either you, well, no, you don't. You don't even have this in time for Kodoro, so you're really just using this for like if you want Ryoma and then Endgame. And also, like another thing to say is that in that situation where you're doing Camilla Midori, uh, Camilla probably uh, in that situation, Camilla herself has Trample, so you can probably just give her a Brave Axe and kill Takami with her. Uh, I'm just, I just want to put that out there. She, she does need to go through Berserker as well, and. She's her on average. She falls short of the kill threshold, so you have to pump some um, energy drops into her. Yeah, but like it's either putting your best combat unit into a class to give her more combat stats, or putting Kaze into a class that's worse than the class that he's in to get life and death to pass down to his kid, so that you can use his kid for end games. Yeah, I don't think you need life and death. I, it's been a while since I've looked at the calculations, but I'm. I'm pretty sure it's not necessary. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah, Dragon Fang tier. This goes Dragon Fang. 
Uh, okay, here we come to Golden Bane. Actually, Golden Bane has a pretty special place in my heart. It, this is this this skill will carry you for three chapters of conquest and do absolutely nothing for any of the other chapters, and I still like it. Um, chapters. So Golden Bane gives you effective damage two times effectiveness. Keep in mind, not three times, but that's still that's still reasonable. It just means that you do a ton more damage. Two times effectiveness against all mechanists, automatons, uh, stoneborn, and uh, I think that's about it. Uh, and that might seem like a pretty neat, like, small group, but there's there's chapters where that, that comprises a large portion of the enemies. Uh, chapter 17 has a ton of mechanists and has a ton of automatons, so you're going to be doing well there. Chapter 22, Sakura's map, also has a bunch of automatons and a couple of mechanists, so you'll be doing well there. It's good eats there. Um, and uh, most monster maps tend to have at least a couple of the Stoneborn, uh, like around that time, like from chapter 21 onwards, most um, uh, monster, like there's, well, there's only two monster maps from them on, but they have Stoneborn and you can use that. Chapter 26, I mean, you can use it if you really want, but you're gonna, but that's, that's a bit, that's a bit risky. Um, basically, uh, oh, there's another chapter where I remember it being useful on, but I forgot. Uh, yeah, but basically that's, it, it's, it's really useful for a little bit of the game, but, uh, it's it's in a class that's not that terrible, and I just think it's a nice it's it's just a nice skill to have for a couple of maps. Uh, yeah, probably nice to have somewhere is, is fair for this. Uh, I think the most useful place for it is in Chapter Twenty One of Conquest against the Wary Fighter Stoneborn. Um, but that map is one where you also kind of want to fly. Um, so if you can get Golem Bane on a flyer and use that to like one shot Stoneborn, that's nice. Um, typically, you're not I mean, going you on just... that kind of class path, though. Yeah, but also you can just like average Xander with a core and pair up can just take zero damage from every enemy that isn't the boss. So you can just like you can just go to the end of the map yeah. and call it. A day. I mean, if you're flyer skipping it, then you don't really need this at all. So that doesn't. Doesn't really yeah, speak I think to the I would put it. Um, I would put it on like I, like the poison strike tier because poison strike you're not using it all the time, but it, like you will know it, it. You'll know occasionally notice. I, it. I think it's certainly worse than most of the skills we already have and nice to have, just because the actual use cases, like the situations where it comes into play, are not that numerous, and you can deal with those situations in several other ways, especially like the chapter seventeen. Huh? In conquest, with the example with the uh, the mechanist, uh, yeah, it can work against the mechanist, but uh, usually you could stack your stats enough to handle them. Anyway, um, like it, it's one of many different skills that can help you approach some of those chapters. So it's um, it's yeah, nice to have, but nothing major. It does. It does also. I do. I guess I should mention. It does also come into play on like uh, Invasion Three in Conquest, which is full of like, very scary Stoneborn. If you care about if that at all, if you're going to Invasion Three, you're asking for pain. <laughs> like, I already I, don't do Invasion. I wouldn't 2. recommend playing it in a normal run. It's very much a challenge, man. Okay. Uh, now we come to the polar opposite, which is uh, Replicate. Oh man, this is a skill that I love, but you get it so late. This 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 skill right here is for Birthright or Revshura, and that's the only time that I can see the skill being like relevant, especially Revshura because he joins pretty early. Um, Replicate is a level fifteen mechanist skill, and it lets you make two of yourself. And having an extra unit is just good, and especially when your unit is level fifteen promoted, that's pretty good. Um, this skill is probably going to be most relevant on Jacob if you can get him into mechanist and Shura. Those are the two units that I would see this coming into play most on because Shura is a pre-promote and Jacob is also a pre-promote but he also gets like good EXP and also he gets promoted skills earlier. Uh, but even outside of them, like if you're doing late game paralogs, this skill will help you out a lot. Having having an extra, you know, having an extra Kaze, having an extra Shura, having an extra Saizo, having an extra Kagoro, you know, have I don't know, having an extra Mozu even if you can get her into Mechanist for a few a few levels when it's late in the game, uh, that's going to help you out a lot. There's a lot of maps in Conquest, Birthright, Rev that uh, in the paralogs that you just aren't supposed to have more units. And the game isn't designed for that, and the, the number of enemies you face is based on the number of units you're supposed to have, and 
in having more units than the, than you're supposed to, you can just cheese some parts of the map. Like, for example, it's gonna make your, uh, if you do Soleil par Soleil's Paralog late, which I wouldn't really recommend because Soleil's a pretty, Soleil is a pretty good unit, um, but either way, uh, if you do Soleil's Paralog late, uh, this is gonna, like, fix up a lot of your issues with, you know, not necessarily always having enough units to choke all of the points that you create. Like, uh, or, um, you know, th that's just one example. Like, you can also split up a lot easier on Nina's Paralog, stuff like that. Now, uh, something that's interesting is that stuff that happens to one replica will you happen to the other. So they share HP, they share what weapon they're equipping, they share their, uh, they share their level ups, they share their, you know, um, do they share their, st I, yeah, I think they share their, like, stat buffs, so, uh, pop tonics and, uh, inspiring songs and also go for it. Um, they don't count as a unit, so for example, if your corn uses Replicate and you have your Gunter backpack the Replicate corn, you will not get the plus 3 damage dealt in the plus 15 hit. Uh, because it's not the main character, it's a replicate of the main character. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's basically all I wanted to mention about replicate. Yeah, they don't count as actually being the main character for the effects of those skills. Um, they also don't benefit from or provide support bonuses. So your, your replica doesn't get like extra guard, guard stance stat boost from your para partner, and it doesn't provide like, extra hit or crit avoid or anything to adjacent people if you support them. Um, I think Replicate is probably the most overrated skill in Fates. Um, yes, it can give you like extra units to play with. Um, I just, every, every time I've tried it out, I've always found that like, it doesn't do as much for me as I wish it would. Um, mainly because you really, you do have enough units to do all the things you need to do. And... Actually, in a lot of situations, having to spend your turn one action on using the replicate command can be a real drag. Um, it, it really limits like the, the amount of things you can get done on turn one. Like you can't have that unit sheltering or or um, like pairing up with other people or anything like that. And it does complicate positioning quite a bit. Like if you're going out and you're, you're making max going your max move and then you're replicating that can block other units or depending on the terrain it can be it can make you put things in awkward spots um it's it's always something that i feel like works a lot better in theory than it does in practice uh yes you can replicate uh, a unit that you've dumped a bunch of stat boosters in and have two super units um but most of the time you can just have one super unit and they can do all the things that your replica would do anyway. Um, so I'm actually tempted to call this more of a niche skill because it, it comes so late and I, from what I've tried with it, it just doesn't do as much for you as you kind of hope it would. Uh, you know you know what you needed to try to do? Like, obviously this wouldn't ever be able to do it in a normal run, but you need to try to use Replicate in the early game. Like, just put it on, like, just give it to your corn or something. Oh my god, dude. Like, chapter 10 becomes, uh, turns from pretty difficult to, is this, is this kind of, is this supposed to be a joke map or something? Well, yeah, like, I, I believe that. Like, if I could du duplicate my best units for the first few chapters, that would be awesome. And it, yeah, I think I mean you could probably rush it on Jacob or something if you really. Yeah, tried. you can I mean, on board. on Jacob or Felicia. You can. Uh, problem for them is they actually have kind of bad stats, and like Ninja doesn't doesn't work for them nearly as well as you might imagine. Uh, Let's see. Mechanist Jacob has. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Forty five percent speed, eight speed base. 30% uh, defense, 40% rest, 60% HP, 40% strength, 55% skill. Do you at least he gets to keep his shuriken rank of D. That's like that's like one okay thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I I agree. I think I think it's like I think it's above shove, below life and death. Okay. B because I think that if you have replicate in your skill set, you're going to be able to figure out a way to do something with it. Yeah, probably. Uh, next up is lethality. Uh, I'm making a new tier called. Uh, funny, and this is this is where I'm going to put uh, this is where I'm going to put lethality. Uh, lethality is a meme skill, and it is a great meme skill, but it is still a meme skill, and that's basically where I'm going to put it. It's point skill divided by four percent chance of just killing an enemy, and 
just kill like we've said this so many times if you're gonna if you, instead of proc skills just do damage stacks and lethality is the is the definition of just damage stack dude it, like it has a pretty cool animation though you know 3ds animations it's not necessarily the greatest but um yeah no lethality is just it's it no you go into master ninja for a bunch of things none of those things is named lethality yeah it actually ends up working against you quite a bit um because ninjas tend to rely a lot on the fact that they can counterattack pretty much everything and they double pretty much everything so that gets them guard gauge pretty quickly it's like one of the ways that kaze can be a lot more survival than you might expect uh but if he starts cracking lethality on everything he counters um, which is unlikely but it's it's skill over four uh, but if he does then like you can rob yourself of some guard gauge that you would have had otherwise uh, but i mean at that yeah. point you just start using bronze daggers like realistically you're probably already using bronze weapons so like that's it, yeah although for the specific you're case you're probably not going to be hurting yourself using lethality you're just never going to be helping yourself using yeah lethality. the thing with daggers is specifically in conquest where you get a free steel shuriken with kaze is it's actually kind of hard to make a dagger that's as good as the as the steel shuriken so you're generally using that until fairly late where you might want to forge an iron dagger potentially um uh so i have a counterpoint to that and that is that kaze has a six luck base and a 20 percent luck growth so without a bronze dagger he is getting crit and he is dying uh it depends who he faces like um if if he's mostly facing like omioji and falcon knights and stuff he's gonna be fine if you if you put him up against spear masters and sorcerers, uh, sorcerers he can generally do okay with because he has uh, really high res. But like spear masters or berserkers or something with innate crit. Um, yeah, but like chapter he, eighteen, the right side you can't just send him in there because there's going to be that Mjolnir sorcerer and he's going to have kind of solid. Uh, he's going to have crit on him and he's going to deal four times damage instead of three times. And it's just, I, I think the yeah. bronze dagger. It's it's easier than, to justify a bronze dagger than it might be. I think. Like, so you can use the Steel Shuriken as a defensive weapon because it gives you two extra speed, makes you even harder to be doubled. But you can still get a Bronze Dagger and make it work fine. Or a Hunter's Knife to deal effective damage. Yeah, that, that's the other thing is you, sometimes you want the Hunter's Knife. And in that case, you don't get to... You don't get the uh, anti-proc features of the Bronze Weapons, nor do you get the uh, Crit Avoid. All right, uh, let's get to Shuriken Fair. Shuriken Fair is another fair skill, um, by which I mean it's an unfair skill because it's <laughs> really good. Uh, it does five more damage, and on Shurikens, this is pretty good because I mean let's let's take a, let's take the Bronze Dagger that I was talking about. Um, bronze Dagger, uh, Bronze Dagger plus two. Let's say Bronze Dagger plus two is going to have six might. This gives me five extra damage. That's that doubles my weapon might effectively almost, uh, and that's stupid. Uh, Daggers uh, really benefit from this a lot because you're again as like if you're a ninja, a master ninja to get this skill because this is master ninja level 15, you're going to be doubling and you're going to be getting value off of it. Master ninja, okay, this actually isn't going to come up too much, but master ninja actually has a uh, innate bonus of plus five percent hit, crit, avoid, and dodge. This is normally only given to weapon locked classes, but they really wanted to give master ninja even more favoritism, so they were like, "Yep, here's here's some bonuses." I don't know why, but they just they did. Um, Shuriken Fair can, uh, like, uh, you, uh, Kaze, Kaze is a great example of somebody that can really be helped out by Shuriken Fair. Towards the late game, Kaze can kind of end up becoming, becoming a potato, uh, without the Hunter's Knife. He kind of starts relying on it to get a lot of kills. But then, once he gets Shuriken Fair, he can actually start keeping up with a lot of stuff, and he can also go back to his Bronze Dagger and get some more, uh, Crit Avoid, or just get some more Avoid, or get some, go to the Steel Shuriken and get some more defensive, uh, uh, follow speed so he can have, I don't know, more Avoid or some nonsense like that. But, you know, you can, you can, you can have more options. Uh, I think, I think Shuriken Fair is, is really good because it's on a, it's on a weapon type that's already got one to two range, and that just really helps out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being the only physical weapon type that innately has unrestricted one two range is excellent. Um, I would say Shuriken Fair is certainly better than Sword Fair. Um, I'd probably put it above HP plus five. I still don't think I'd put it above any of the things that are <laughs> yeah, higher. It's, it's inspiring song is just uh, inspiring song is the brick wall that separates the skills that are good and the skills that are great. Yeah, I, I could maybe see putting it ahead of Inspiring Song specifically, but that would be an argument that I don't think is really worth having. Yeah. 
Uh, let's move on to, so now uh, we are in Oni Chieftain. Uh, this is Death Blow. Uh, so this is not actually uh, Three Houses Death Blow or Fire Emblem Heroes Death Blow. You do not get damage. This is Fate's Death Blow, where you get plus 20 crit on initiation. Um, in the hands of enemies, this is kind of underwhelming. In the hands of players, it's kind of underwhelming. All in all, kind of underwhelming. Um, yeah, I just, Death Blow is, it's, it's meh all around. The only saving grace is that it's death. It's got extra crit, and you have access to the great club, so you can do dumb stuff with it. So I do, I do respect the fact that they've given you the ability to do that. But other than that, like, there's just no real use for death blow. Uh, well, I don't know about that. Like, there's there's usage just for it, but you don't need to rely on crits, right? You can just deal more enough damage to kill the enemy. Yeah, it's just like that damage stacking is super reliable. Um, but death blow does make crit stacking a more viable option. It means that you can do you can set up for kills in other ways. If you just can't hit the speed thresholds to one round them somehow, even though you have like up to like 13 points of speed that you can get from dead speed stacking, uh, uh, you can you can you, this is an alternate avenue, but it's a significantly worse avenue. So I don't think it's going anywhere close to like uh, I don't think it's going anywhere close to any skill that helps you with damage stacking, right? Because uh, except for maybe life and death, because it because life and death can also hurt you. So I don't think it's going. Uh, I think so. I think it has to go. Uh, it has to go below. Uh, it has to go below. Uh, it has to go below. What am I thinking here? Uh, it has to go below these. Obviously, has to go below all of these skills. I think it's going in like maybe nice to have, probably niche. Yeah, I probably lean towards niche. Um, Deathflow does let you do some very entertaining crit stacking stuff, um, and it. In a way, it kind of helps that it's player phase only, because uh, if you're making, if you're like trying to do death blow strats, uh, it's not something that's gonna hurt you with accidental crits on player on enemy phase. Um, yeah, it, like you, you can definitely do a crit stacking thing if you really want to have that. Uh, it's just not a great build to go for. I would probably put it under. Uh, Voice of Peace myself. Out in the middle of niche. Below Voice of Peace. Uh, no. Um, okay. Um, yeah, it's actually probably worse than Dragon Fang now that I think about it. Because just from a strategic perspective, there are things that Dragon Fang enables you to not have to worry about if you don't want to. Whereas with Death yeah. Blow, it doesn't really do that. Um, okay, let's go to Counter. Counter is... It's worth than Spendthrift okay, too, let's be the, real. Yeah, uh, below Spend... I don't know if it's below Spendthrift, actually, because Spendthrift requires you to actively spend a resource. Uh, yeah, but it's very consistent, and I like that. Uh, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Um, Counter is a skill, it's the level 15 Oni Chieftain skill. It is whenever an, uh, an enemy initiates combat against you at one range, be it magical or physical, uh, and they don't kill you, um, the damage that they deal to you will also be dealt back to them. Personally, the way I see it is, counter is entirely dependent upon who you have it on and whether you're willing to let them die. This might sound like a dumbass thing to say, but there's actually a real reason for this. If you capture people, there are a reasonable number of actually surprisingly early captures in Conquest that have uh, counter. You can get captures as early as chapter 11 that have counter, and you and generics are pretty damn good. Like they're not like great because they can't have supports, they can't get support points, but they make up for it often by having stupid skills like counter. You see where I'm going with this? Counter. Um, Counter is basically only going to be on um, somebody that you capture from the uh, Setsuna room on Chapter 11 or Kumagera. Those are the only people that- oh wait, no, uh, Kumagera gets to that level 15, but Kumagera uh, does have an innately lower uh, internal level, like like a surprisingly low one, uh, and he joins at level 2 promoted or level 1 promoted. Uh, but like you can, you will get counter on Kumagera around uh, chapter, chapter 20 or so, and that's actually much earlier than most people. And uh, it actually works really well with this moveset because by then he'll have death blow, darting blow, certain blow, counter, counter magic. So it's yeah, um, I, I it's 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 you can do some absolute nonsense with it in the late game with the captures that you get. Um, it's kind of dog shit early game, 
It's it's funny because you think that you it would be better early, early game because you can because the it's a strong effect, um, but uh, the HP that you have in late game is just much more conducive to doing stuff with uh, with con counter than it is in the early game. Mm -hmm. Basically, what I'm saying is that if you're willing to let your captures go into very dangerous situations, then you can do some stuff with counter. Yeah, for the record, Kumagera's internal level is 16, which is one higher than Camilla's. Um, yeah, counter is definitely a lot more effective on disposable units, so generally that means it's a lot better on the enemy units than it is on yours. Uh, you can do suicide tactics with captured enemies, or if you, for whatever reason you want to train up a, a, a proper unit to get counter and then sacrifice them, I guess you can. Uh, if you're Excelblum or something. Um, I don't think it... I don't think counter tactics are all that good. And it's mainly just because, yeah, it, it can help you deal more damage on enemy phase, I guess. Um, but again, this is a game where you can definitely just get enough power to kill things normally. And also in the late game, um, a lot more enemies have ranged weapon options. Like they're not all just one range locked. So, it's actually relatively, I wouldn't say uncommon, but there are a lot more cases where you're going to get attacked at two range by, you know, like physical units than you might think you would. Um, there's a good number of random physical units who have like tomahawks or spears or have a magic weapon. So. Yeah, again, Oni Chieftains are rampant in chapter 22, 23, 24. You will see them all the time. Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't actually do that much most of the time when you get to this skill late in the game as a level 15 promoted skill. Um, yes, you, you can get it on captured units. You can treat them as disposables who, uh, who can just sacrifice their own HP to take it away from the enemies if you want. Um, I don't really recommend that kind of strategy. Uh, especially because it... Oh yeah, no, no, I'm not saying it's good. I'm yeah. saying that you can do stuff with it. Uh, I'm saying that if you're going to use it, use it on catch. Yeah, um, I'd probably put it at pretty much at the bottom of the niche. Okay, I, I think I want to put it above seal strength. Um, okay, one thing, I, one thing, one last thing I want to say about counter. If you want to ever utilize counter to its fullest extent, there's a, on Lunatic, there's, again, I keep talking about this guy. There's a sniper on chapter 23 that has life and death and counter. This guy is an absolute savage. You can capture him. Basically, you can stack him enough defense that he survives because they have pretty solid HP and defense. And basically, if the enemy attacks him at one range, uh, they're going to take counter damage. If they attack him at two range, they're going to take bow damage with... Uh, and because he's high, high level, you're going to get bow fare soon. And they'll take damage from a bow guy that also has life and death, and they're going to absolutely eat shit. And you'll also get certain blow at some point, so you deal even more consistent and good damage. Um... If you want to use life, if you want to use life and death or counter, I would use them on that archer guy because it's it's actually a lot of fun. I've used him a lot, especially in like a forest paralog to do some absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, just just a small recommendation before we move on to uh, salvage blow. Not to be confused with uh, savage blow. Uh, salvage blow is a is a proc rate that I don't particularly p particularly care about to. Um, after combat, you get a basic weapon, iron weapon. So basically, it's like Profiteer if Profiteer was different. Uh, actually, wait, hold up. <laughs> yeah, it's luck percent chance of getting an iron weapon of the type that matches what your enemy was wielding. Um, wait, what the hell? This is just straight up better than Profiteer. Well, it's, all, it's uh, oh, you have to kill. You have the to kill. Enemy, of yes. Um, but again, you, this is fates. Like you, you have ways of making it happen. Yeah, it also doesn't work on enemies who are using tomes or scrolls at all. You can only get uh, physical weapons. Uh, oh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, so you can only get uh, iron katana, naginata, club, shuriken, or yumi. Oh, uh, by the way, for people that don't know what class this is in, I don't blame you. It's in blacksmith, and nobody cares about blacksmith. Mm -hmm. It is in Blacksmith. Um, yeah, it's... I wouldn't say it's worse Profiteer, it's kind of different Profiteer. It's certainly more effective in 
birthright because you or revelation because you can actually forge those weapons and that's awesome um in conquest you can't so you basically just get a bunch of free iron weapons that you can sell for 500 yeah it's like each. it's like the brass naginatus that you get there's one on mozu there's one on azura there's one on a bunch of other units but you can never force them. You, it's only those two in Conquest, but yeah, you can never oh, force them. Oh, never mind. I was, I was thinking about something else. Yeah, you, you get like an Iron Naginata off Shigure and a couple of, like an Iron Yumi from Midori, I think. Um, yeah, so it's, it's certainly more effective in Birthright because you have the flexibility to either sell the item you get or forge it into some very, very strong plus two, plus three, even plus four irons. Um, assuming you have the gems for that, which, depending on your circumstances, you may or may not. Um, I think it's... I mean, like, even, like, an Iron Shuriken is going to be better than any Iron Dagger that you have. Because Iron Shuriken versus Iron Dagger is that Iron Dagger has five more hit, and Iron Shuriken gives you plus two speed. So, yeah. Yeah, you would probably use it over an unforged Iron Dagger. If you were trying to forge an Iron Dagger to make something that's better than your Steel Shuriken that you get in Conquest, like you're trying to get to a plus two, then certainly the Iron Dagger will, will be better. Um, um, I think I actually think that it's just straight up better with Profiteer. Like, I personally believe that, like, you, with Profiteer, you're already going to be going through the hoops. So, adding, like, the, the only hoop that this adds is that you have to kill the enemy, and you have to, uh, and you have to attack an enemy that's not using magic. And those are some pretty, those are some pretty easy hoops to jump through, considering that you're stacking forty luck on a un unit. Yeah, probably salvage blow is going to be more effective than profiteer if you get it. Um, it. However, it is on a class with much worse distribution, and that is basically worse overall. Um, oh, I actually don't know about that. Um, let's see, merchant. Merchant has uh, merchant has like some a bunch of strength, a bunch of defense, not much speed. Merchant is but, like uh, an Blacks armor unit, basically. Um, yeah, but with, Blacksmith has Blacksmith, Blacksmith straight up is just Blacksmith is like a hero. Yeah, Blacksmith, yeah, Blacksmith, Blacksmith is, is essentially hero with A and axes instead of A and swords. Yeah, it's a hero with one less skill and one more defense. I mean, how how's I mean that's not really bad distribution. Hero is a pretty solid class in terms of stat distribution. No, I didn't mean stat distribution. I mean the the, the characters who can get to it. Uh, oh, right, right, right. You, you right. have to go through Oni Savage. Oni Savage. Um, and there is Rinka can certainly do that. Um, no one else starts as an Oni Savage, and the other characters who want to go into it are mainly mages, actually, who want to have the huge bulk they can get from Oni Chieftain. Huh? Hinata can, Hinata can make some decent use out of it. Uh, he can, yeah. But Hinata, as a combat unit, he mainly prefers staying with Swordmaster for the higher base speed. Um, I guess so, yeah. The practice katana just so, makes so much more nonsense yeah. possible. So, like... So yeah, like someone like Hinata can go over to Blacksmith and pick this up, and then go back, um, and that has a decent chance of paying for itself. The problem for him is uh, heart seal availability, because uh, you probably wouldn't be getting to this. Well, Hinata usually wants to promote early, so it would be great for him if he could like in the middle of the game go go get salvage blow and then go back to Swordmaster. But Birthright only had like four heart seals before chapter 21, or before the end of chapter 20. And um, I mean, the situation in Rev is better, but also there are better units to invest in in Revelation. True, true, true. Um, um, so. I think you can make space for it, but because, I mean, it's not like the availability of Merchant is that much better than the availability of Blacksmith. Not hugely, no. Um, it's just Mozu. And, it's, and it's just Mozu's one extra unit. Mozu and then Midori getting it automatically in there. A couple other people. Yes, and like, instead of Rinka getting it automatically, and there's no like Mozu equivalent for Blacksmith. I think I think I think I want to put it exactly where Profiteer is. Okay. Yeah, the, the other advantage for Profiteer is it actually exists on every route, whereas you have to use Corn's talent or like train an Oni Savage capture in Conquest to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm willing to put it, but I think that they're basically the same skill, honestly. Yeah, they have, they're very similar. They have very similar effects. Uh -huh. 
Um, and also, I think the fact that you're getting almost double the money makes up for most of the drawbacks here. Uh, and also the potential ability to forge it. Uh, okay, next up we go to Lancebreaker. Man, a lot of these breaker skills are pretty cool. Lancebreaker is not one of those. Lances, while Lance enemies do have a lot of hit, they're really scary in the early game in Conquest. And this is a blacksmith skill, so that's neither of- This is a level 15 promoted class skill that's a birthright exclusive, so it's not early game, it's not Conquest, so neither of those boxes are getting checked. Um, I just don't see it being that useful. Uh, Lancebreaker, like, breaker skills are often great for, like, if you need both the hit and the avoid. If, like, for example, like, Swordbreaker is pretty nice because sword, sword, swords have good hit, but they don't have exceptional hit. Whereas, like, bows and daggers have exceptional hit. Swords have good hit. Um, but, like, with a unit that just has, like, privilege because it's a player unit and you have the ability to control your own stats, you can get enough avoid to have lower hits on you, and also, sword enemies tend to have higher avoid and you can guarantee more hits on them. Whereas, lance, lance enemies have okay hit, lance enemies have good hit, but they don't really have much avoid. They just tend to have, like, okay avoid. Um... I just don't see it as being as useful because there's not that many relevant lance enemies that you're you're scared of. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, like if I had access to lance breaker in the conquest maps where you're facing a bunch of spear masters, like chapter twenty or uh, areas in chapter twenty three, I wouldn't say no to it. Uh, chapter twenty four too. There's a bunch of uh, falcon knights. That's true. Although. I mean, they're not very scary, <laughs> offensively. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like, I, w I wouldn't be unhappy to have it. It's just... Like, they're not... There are... You do face a lot of lances. Um, enemy lances. It would be good to have this. It's just... It's not something you ever really need to build around. Um, and there, there are no, like... There are no maps that are specially designed with lance enemies that are going to mess you up if they hit you you can just tank the hits for the most part so yeah and it's not about well i mean there there are a lot of maps that have lance enemies that have three seal skills to be fair like chapter 20 that like you mentioned yeah but they don't have to and hit on you on those maps yeah but they don't have to hit you that's the thing right the avoid doesn't help you against that yeah so you just want to kill them back and I just don't think it's Lance good. Fair, or Lance Breaker doesn't do that much. I'd put it at a low end of niche. Or maybe, no, yeah, low, low end of nice to have, I guess. Because... Uh, uh, this is, like, okay, Lance Breaker has so much less of a use case than, for example, Golden Bane. Yeah. I mean... I think I, I think, I, I think that you're doing Lance, of, Lance Breaker an unnecessary service by putting it anywhere above Voice of Peace. <laughs> okay. Fine. I think I think we put it below seal res and we call it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the, the our gatekeepers are basically the this tier and then inspiring song and then demoiselle and then golem bane and then inspiring and then like and then uh, and then voice of peace. Those are those are our gateways. Um, let's see. Next step is uh, seal speed. Seal speed is like it's conceptually pretty solid minus six speed on enemies, but the use case is meh. If you're planning out player phases and like it's great on feeding kills to somewhat slower units um like if you have like a kind of under leveled percy and you put him into malignite even though you know it's not a great idea uh but because you wanted to do dumb stuff um i respect it don't get me wrong but we all know that his he's gonna have some he's gonna struggle doing his stuff until he gets trample and gets his magic going um seal speed is going to help you out a lot um it's a level 5 promoted skill, so which means that if you promote early, you can get it pretty early, uh, pretty uh, easily. Um, Hitaka is, uh, I uh, personally, I think that the easiest way to get it, he gets a bunch of HP, he can just have a javelin, and he can just sit and just absolutely, like, shred enemy uh, like, stats with seal defense, seal speed, and walk in with any physical unit you want and just eat them up for breakfast, and, uh, it's, it's nice. It's like, it's like the, it's the same effect as what, uh, where is Dracon Dr It's the same effect as what Draconic Hex does, except on a lower lower scale, more specialized into speed. And speed is a pretty important stat, but like for often you need the speed and also you need the offense. That's what that's what makes Draconic Hex so valuable as a kill feeding and consistency tool. Uh, 
The only other value that seal speed gives you is absolutely shit canning enemies avoid. Like if you if you if you have if you somehow have uh, seal speed against like like Vioma in chapter twelve, he's not avoiding any of your hits after he gets hit with that. No, it's, um, it's other than that, avoid, I don't really see much use. So. That that is nice. Yes. Yeah, nine avoid is. I mean, that's that's the, that's the difference between swapping between an iron weapon and a bronze weapon. Like you're gonna notice the hit, mm -hmm. especially in uh, tr uh, two RN like a hybrid RN situation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we've discussed this a little bit. We've discussed this before, but uh, this is definitely better than seal strength, but I think a little bit worse than seal defense because the main thing that these seal skills do for you on a on a daily basis is they let you clean up the things that you weren't able to kill in enemy phase more easily. Um, and I think for the most part, seal defense... Uh, enhances your damage output on the following player phase a bit more than seal speed will um but you can put the two of them together fairly nicely and just triple everything that attacks you um and it does have applications against bosses as well um like you can drag along your seal speed person and hit someone who's on a throne or a gate to mitigate some of their avoid there and Kind of the same way as you can use Draconic Cat. Seal speed on like Ko Ko Kotaro, uh, you'll probably be able to one-hit KO him very easily after that. Mm -hmm. uh, is that fine? Do you think uh, below uh, Natural Cover? Yeah. Well, actually, th actually, you know what? I think I want to put it below Swap. Okay. Well, next up, we move on to Lance Fair. Lance Fair is kind of in the same boat as Sword Fair, except it doesn't have the uh, like. There's no like. There's no like. Oh my God, this lance is absolutely insane. I need to use it all the time. Um, javelins are pretty nice. Keep in mind, javelins are pretty nice. And if you and if you get a Perry's lance, then whew, you are cooking with some gas if you get Lance Fair, because Perry lance, Perry's lance is a very solid um, weapon. If you can like. Perry's Lance on any unit that has soul is like is like you're doing Master Ninja strats except slightly different. Well, you can't double, and, and it also has really low base might. It's like three. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's why that's where Lance Fair comes in and helps out. And, and I'm obviously with like Umbrella, Perry's Lance, all these things. You're, I'm assuming that you have merges because without merges, they're garbage. Um, I think I think Lance Fair is a, is, a, is a like you're gonna want to have it. Like you're gonna want to equip it because you're not gonna go into Spear Master if you're not using lances. You're not gonna want to. If you if you if you even if you're even considering getting lance fair, then it's probably because you're gonna be using lances, so it's good. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that I'll point out is that it's actually kind of funny because like you know how we said that sword fair could be useful for eleven sword stuff. I think that bolt naginata stuff is actually um slightly more applicable. Now one of my favorite strats that's extremely unre like unrealistic but still funny is um bolt naginata sakura. Um, oh, I you love can bolt naginata her, uh, sakura. Yeah, it's the the main issue is the weapon rank, but outside of that, she's actually like okay. You you have to get her rally magic from uh, her own class. You can get her to own Mio. You get rally, uh, I mean rally magic from there. Get rally luck from her base class. Go into uh, Falcon Knight and then get rally speed, and then you can get uh, you can get uh, you can get rally you can get rally speed, and then you get warding blow, darting blow. Warding blow is less useful. You can swap it out for eventually something like lance fair. Well, she can't um, get lance fair. Is is the thing. Yeah, well, that's what. That's why you. I don't know. You can. You can probably figure out a way to get her um, you, married to somebody that can. Well, no, because there are no men in the first generation who have spear fighter. Um, well, uh, is the, can she a plus with Obero or something? No, her friends are um, Azura, Kinoka, and Elise, I believe. Um, so she. So she can get Sky Knight three different Zura ways, give? but she can't get spear fighter. <laughs> yeah, she does. Um, well, I. Uh, yeah, but yeah, uh, so I mean, I was, Naginata, you can also do it on stuff like you can also do it on basically any Falconite that has a non-bad magic set, um, especially on like somebody that's actually like a good unit before promotion um, and has been using lances. But you know, I I don't think that's enough of a like to move it above any or above or below any skills. I um, I don't think I don't see it being better than darting blow straight up. It's uh, but again against these three skills, I don't think it's I don't think you're I don't think. Any of these skills should be below always worthwhile. The fair skills, because again, you're gonna want them. Yeah. They're always worthwhile to have in your skill set. Yeah, I, I, but, uh, I think Lance Fair is probably the weakest of the six, and it's because it just doesn't come up in the. It's just not available in the builds where you'd really want it. Like we discussed Sakura, you can get it on Hinoka, who has 
decent-ish magic um, because she has Spear Fighter as her alternate class. Um, and that works fine. Um, it's actually pretty helpful for her because it makes the Bolt Nugging out a lot more viable on her. And there's there aren't any other good lances to work with. Like it's not like Sword Fair where at least it it counts for a lot on on Ryoma and Xander. And it's not like Shuriken Fair or we're going to discuss Tome Fair in a while, um, where you've got like built-in one-two range. So you either want the ways that you get the most out of something like Lance Fair are to have it with brave weapons or like strong one-two range. And you can't get Braves in Birthright, not a Brave Lance anyway. And you're only one, two. Yeah, late game conquest generics you can get like this stuff easily on, but that's basically the only point in time you're going to be able to effectively use Brave Lance Lance Fair. Mm -hmm. And um, your your only really good one, two range Lance is the Bolt Naginata. Um, like it's helpful to combine with other things like Water Wheel and the Guard Naginata before that if you wanted to use those things, uh, but they just don't have two range at all, so um, it doesn't work as well as you might hope, because you just don't get to s see the effect of Lance Fair coming up like six times on a single enemy phase, in most cases. Um, so it's, yeah, it's worth getting on a Lance unit who has access to it. Uh, I mentioned before, like in a lot of a lot of the time, like dipping into another late game class for one of these like plus five damage skills is gonna be more efficient money-wise than um, forging up a, an extra weapon with that 4,000 gold that you might spend. And it also applies to specialty weapons. Like, you can't forge a Brave Lance. Uh, you can't forge uh, a dual Naginata. Well, you kind of, you can actually in Birthright, you can get two, but like you really can't afford to forge them. Um, so it, it tends to be more efficient. You can't, you can't really afford to forge like a Sword Catcher or something. Yeah. Um, so the the weapon fairs apply not only to a apply to every weapon you have in that type, not just the one you spent all the money on to forge. Yeah, um, uh, I'm, I agree with that. Uh, do you like what the, where I've placed it? Um, yeah, I think that's respectable. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move on to uh, Ren Heaven and Quixotic, which kind of go hand in hand and are both Basara class, uh, Basara. Um, man, Basara is one hell of a weird class, but it's got some, it, it, Basara has some skills, man. And I can't, I don't know if they're good, but they do look and sound cool. Um, Rend Heaven and Quixotic. Uh, Rend Heaven, let's start off with Rend Heaven, of course. Rend Heaven is a skill times 1.25 chance, I think. 1.5, um, I think. Uh, Rend Heaven. Okay, Rend Heaven is a uh, skill times 1.5 chance to deal half of those strength or magic as bonus damage, and I don't know what that's based on. I think it's based on what you're using. It's based on what you're using, magic. yes. So if you're using the so physical weapon, using it takes the enemy's strength. Now, this can be pretty good, but it can also be absolutely useless, because, like, for example, if you're up against a Berserker and you're using a Tome, yeah, that's not doing anything. That's straight up just not doing anything. If you're up against a Sorcerer and you're using a Sword, that's not doing anything. Uh, but other than that, for the most part, enemies have high enough, like, a lot of, like, there's a lot of mixed classes, again, later as you get on. There's enemy Basaras, there's enemy Oni Chieftains, there's enemy Dar uh, Dark Knights, there's enemy Malignites, there's, you know, there's a lot of this um, mixed class stuff. You are going to get some value out of Rend Heaven if you have it. The main issue with Rend Heaven is that it's in a class that's actual garbage. Uh, Basara has, like, such, like, wildly bad stats. The mm. only reason I ever would go Basara is, like, occasionally I do it with Orochi because it gives her some more defense. Um, but, like, other than that, oh, man, it's just not that great of a class. The pair bonus is, like, luck in something, so it's really bad, uh, like, even conceptually. I think it's five luck and three yeah. skill. Oh, my um. God. <laughs> wow, they were really trying to make it a bad pair up. Yes. But, uh, but uh, Basara is a class that you go into for the skills, and I, I, can, I can see that. Like, that, that's, a, that's a fair, like, that's, that's a cool design space for class, so I don't really mind it too much, but that doesn't change the fact that it's a bad class. Sorry, it's five luck and three uh, reds. Um. Okay, that's, 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 that's slightly better, though still not that great. 
Uh, I think that Red Heaven is a is a fine proc skill. Uh, it, I I would put it into the like if you are going to be building like Red Heaven is one of the few po like things that it's so reliable that you can actually get away with building around proc skills because you can stack up to forty skill and get a sixty percent chance to hit Red Heaven and then you add Quixotic on top of that to get to ninety. And uh, then you're kind of uh, then you're kind of moving. Uh, Quixotic doesn't add thirty to proc rates; it adds fifteen. Fifteen? Oh yeah. my bad. Doesn't it? Oh, it adds to hit as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's thirty to hit. Yeah, it's thirty to hit. My bad. Uh, but still, uh, that's like you add that's that's Ren Heaven, and that's like that's uh, what I said forty five, so sixty, and then uh, seventy five, and then if you have like any other proc skill, like if you have. Uh, Astra on top of that, then you have, like, and you, you know, you had what, uh, f 45 skill, 45 divided by 2 is 23, and then it's 23 plus 15, which is 40, 48%, and then if you don't get the 48%, you get to a 75%. You can see where, to the point where you're going to activate something that's going to either kill the enemy or make, you, make sure you survive the combat. Mm -hmm. um, like, Red Heaven, like, Basara is one of the few things that can make it so that, like, it's as, it's, it's as effective, at least, as damage stacking. And it's in one class, it's in one package, so it's not that hard to get. Uh, I think, I think you're terribly underrating, uh, Basara. Um, because, uh, it's basically just, like, a free bulky mage class. Uh, yeah, it's terrible for para. Um. But, like, if you're actually using Orochi or Hayato as a combat unit, they're much better off going into Basara than into Omiyoji. Um, Just one thing, for Hayato at least, uh, if you want a bulky mage class, Oni Chieftain is right there. But it does cost you a heart seal, which are unlimited. So it does cost you a heart seal, which is fair, but, but uh, at that point, like, uh, like, the point where you need so much bulk that it matters, you can just go into Oni Chieftain. Like, um, that, because you're probably the late game by then. Yeah. Um, Rend Heaven is... It's okay, I guess. I'm... I, I know I've hit on this point many times, but I'm just not a believer in offensive procs in a game where you can just get the job done with solid damage. And I usually find that what Rend Heaven will do for me is either nothing, because I would have killed anyway, or... It'll just rob me of... Well, in that case, then, then what it does for you is usually negative, because it'll just sometimes rob you of extra guard gauges for no reason. Um, and... Yeah, it can help you get extra kills if you need the help. You just really don't need the help for the most part. Um, uh, I, think, I think you might be going about this, thinking about this the wrong way again. Um, like, you know, you can do, uh, like, assembling Vantage, Life and Death, Malefic Aura, Trample, and a fair skill all on top of each other. It takes time, but you can get a pretty uh, potent skill combination. You can just kill the enemy instead, too, but it's something unique and cool that you can do. Uh, I, I, think, I think seeing the proc skill builds as something along that vein is more valuable than just seeing it as... Like, why not just kill the enemy instead? Because you can say, why not just kill the enemy instead to basically everything. Yeah. Why not just use I mean, Camilla to, me, to, to me, it's why like not putting... Just use Camilla to the map? To me, it's like doing a crit build. Like, you can definitely do it. Um, it can get you kills. It's just not really the best way to go about things. Um, I think it's probably... Hmm... I would put it right below Shove, honestly, in the high end of niche. Uh, now we come to Quixotic, which is actually, I think, I think this is a very fair, like, very, like, well-made level 15 promoted skill. It is, grants, it gives you hit plus 30 and plus 15% to proc rate to you and your enemy in combat. Um, just throw away the plus 15% to proc rate to enemy because you're never going to see that come into play. The hit plus 30 is what I'm here for. Hit plus 30, baby. Oh my god. If you have ever used Ignots in three houses, you will know what I'm talking about when I say having extra hit rate is the most beautiful thing in the world. Just just seeing that 100 every single time you initiate or get initiated against is so nice. Um, it's just it's just a level of reliability that you really can't get outside of uh, Certain Blow. And let me tell you, I'm going to put Certain Blow right up here. I will, I will fight tooth and nail to put Certain Blow into meta defining. So that's, that's, that, that should tell you how much I think about uh, Quixotic. 
Um, I just think it's a really fun, it's a fun skill in terms of proc rate, and even if you don't use it for proc rate, it gives you a very valuable hit plus 30 bonus against any enemy in the game. Mm -hmm. I love hit plus 30. It's, it's great. Um, if you're using Quixotic, you have to accept that you're not dodging anything, and just be prepared to run the calculations on all the attacks enemies are going to do, and add them Honestly, up and say... that actually makes it better for me, right? Because, like, at that point, you if you if you know that the enemies are going to hit you, then you know how much damage you're taking exactly. Yeah. If sometimes you can actually get screwed over by enemies not hitting you because you want to, like, maybe be in a certain HP range for Vantage or some nonsense like that, but um, but instead, like, with Quixotic, it, it makes things reliable. It's, it's reliability to everybody involved. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I would say it's still not as good as like a weapon fair, um, just because as the player, you get to choose your matchups and your equipment. And usually that means you can set things up in a way where you're putting the right people against the right enemies and they'll, they'll have consistent results anyway. Um, so most of the time you're going to get more mileage out of just straight plus five damage as a late game level 15 skill. Um, but Quixotic is pretty pretty cool. Um, I kind of want to say it's still nice to have and not always worthwhile though because the reasons I just mentioned where because you're the player and you get to you get a lot more flexibility with your inventory and your your tactics than the enemy does. Like it's kind of like with the weapon triangle like you can use that to your advantage where the enemy just gets to use whatever they have. So you can compensate for the things that Quixotic does for you in a lot of other ways. And by the end of the game, you're usually prepared to do that. Yeah, it's it's definitely hurt by the fact that it's a level 15 promoted skill that gives you hit. God, if it were level uh, 5, like, it would be awesome. If it was level 5, then like certain blow would just be dead. Like, certain blow would be in the gutter. Uh, well, maybe not in the gutter. It would still be pretty good, but I just think that Quixotic would definitely give it a run for its money at least. Um, now we come to, um, you know, this, this, this is a nice, like, uh, this is a, this is a nice skill, you know, it's, it's Rally Magic, it's here, it's Rally Magic, it gives you four magic, it just makes you deal more damage, it's level 5 on Miyoji, it's on Izana, so you can get it easily in Conquest, it's on Izana, so you can get it easily in Birthright, you get it late, but, meh. Um, you can even get it earlier in Birthright because you have access to Onmyoji, and Azana joins late in Conquest to compensate for it. It's a fair skill, it's a good skill, it's not a broken skill, it's just a nice skill to have. Mm -hmm. Um, although, I would tend to upgrade it to always worthwhile just on the basis that you, you kind of do want to get this in some capacity somewhere on your team, um, if you're using any real magic units because it's it's very helpful for boss killing um depending on the the magic unit in question they may or may not need that much help need help from rally magic to do general like sweeping generic enemies duty um but it's it's useful i i like having a copy of it um and certainly it enables a bunch of like cool strats with magic units um, um, I will say that it might be, like, this, this is a bit of a weird thing to say, but it might be hurt a little bit by the fact that it's in a class where you get access to both Magic Plus 2 and Tome Fair. So you get two skills that basically already take up skill slots, so you might not always have the space to justify it so if you're going for offensive own Miyoji. But uh, in Conquest, you're basically just getting it on Azana, so it's basically always going to be worthwhile. Yeah, you get it for on Azana for free. Um, you can also get it pretty quickly if you take one of the early Shrine Maiden captures and you promote them to Omiyoji. Um, and then you can get it many, many chapters early. Um, especially if you capture the one in, in the back of chapter 11, who's already ready pro to promote, so you don't have to like train them up with just healing, which is annoying. Um, yeah, I like your placement here. I think it is better than Lance Fair. It's probably worse overall than Rally Luck, just because of the lower applicability. Okay, uh, this is Tome Fair. I'm gonna let you talk about Tome Fair. Uh, Tome Fair is another one of those things that you can combine with every other source of damage stacking to do dumb things. Um, I think, continuing on with the discussion from Lance Fair before, it's better than Lance Fair because it has, it's in a weapon type with an 8-1-2 range, which means you can get just 
more use out of it more of the time. Um, it also, um, in, in Revelation, or if you manage to get it um, in Conquest, uh, it benefits a lot from the fact that you get early braves. Um, like you get lightning, which has, it does have a stat penalty, it does reduce your, your magic and skill by two, but you can still use it over and over again, and if you combine it with damage stacking skills, it doesn't really... I mean, it doesn't even have that penalty if you use it with dual strikes. Yes, you can use it for free on uh, dual strikes, and um, if you just like use it once a turn, it takes a while for the magic and skill penalties to actually stack up on you, because you recover one of the two points every turn. Um... So, I really like that. Uh, I would actually still... Hmm. I, I do think it's... I think it, I think it has to be above Shuriken Fair because it does magical damage. Um, I do... I, I think I disagree, actually. I think it, I would put it right below magic plus two. Uh, and that's because magic, really? magic plus two is just there for... It's like almost half the effect for basically the entire game. And... Um, Onmyoji is actually kind of bad class. So there's a little bit more hardship I mean, to go through. I, don't, Omiyo I I seriously disagree with that because at worst it's plus four magic plus four speed pair up. Um, yeah, as a pair up bot. But if you're like trying to like train through it and get the skills, uh, Omiyoji stats are really bad. I mean, yeah, but can't you just staff spam through it? Oh no! Uh, on Lunatic as a promoted class, uh, your staff healing is, XP is terrible. Um, and, and it's not like you can just you get more experience from using higher level stays but those are expensive um, mm. and in limited yeah, supply because you're not using fortify to staff spam yeah I've never bought fortify in fates and I probably never will oh yeah I, I never plan on either yeah um, same, the same reason I never plan on buying like the physic equivalent in birthright mm -hmm. so uh, the, the knock on tome fair is basically uh, it's limited the amount of time you can use it there's a bit more hardship to go get it uh the number of units who can take advantage of it is actually fairly small because like i've said the way you get the most out of these late game damage stacking skills is either uh you use them a ton on enemy phase and they help you hit thresholds to kill things either by doing enough damage to two shot them or by stacking enough to one shot instead especially with vantage um and it's actually there there aren't that many units who can do that very well uh, you you have to train like hayato can because he has decent stats all around if you train him but he starts in a really bad spot um and then the the norian like mages like not nix but uh odin and leo can do that well but they don't have access to this um except in rev where they can marry for it um so it's it's limited availability. It's it doesn't help you for that much of the game. Um, the units who can get it naturally aren't that great, and it goes you go through a kind of rough patch of training to get it. Yeah. Okay. I, I see. I see where you're coming from. <laughs> you know what's funny? Uh, when you were talking about how uh, magic plus two is basically half the effect for uh, uh, way earlier, I was about to be like, well, strength plus two is half the effect, and then I look at strength plus two and it's significantly yep. above the other fair skills, and then I was like, okay, yeah, you know what? Never mind. Um, uh, renewal. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, I think I've used renewal all of one time, and it was on Great Master Azama. To be fair, it was pretty good in Birthright, because Azama, like, Azama is like the the surprise unit for me when I played in Birthright. Like, he did stuff that I did not expect him to do. Um, and Renewal just helped him out a bit. I don't think it's the... I don't think it's a great skill. I don't think it's a terrible skill. I think you're always going to want to equip it if you have it, because it's just... It's it's a significant amount of healing every single turn, no matter what. And I think that's... I think you can't undersell it. You can't oversell it. It's just that. Yeah, I think if you if you don't if you want low HP, it's garbage. If you don't if you don't want low HP, which is ninety percent of builds, then it's great. And but accessing it is god awful. Uh, yeah, god awful outside of uh, Great Master Azama, really. Um, I guess you can do Priestess Sakura too. She's okay. Um, yeah, Renewal's pretty much the epitome of nice to have. Like, I. If every one of my units got renewal, I would love that. 
Uh, but you don't really need to go out of your way to go get it. Um, I'd, I'd probably put it... Um, I would say higher than that. I, I, would, I would put it around Astra's level, honestly. It's, it's kind of... It's kind of like Astra in that it could, it mitigates the damage you take in, in one way or another. And it does. Yeah, I guess. I guess going. I guess yeah. My, my 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 the thing that it was making me put it down was really just access to great master or, or priestess. Mm -hmm. Um, those classes are actually pretty strong. Uh, they have amazing stats. They have the highest base stat total in, of all classes in the game, I believe. Oh, uh, I, I know. <laughs> I'm aware. Um, so you, insta promote. The great Master Zama like carry me through half of Birthright yeah. before Rio. So th there are some build options that maybe wouldn't be obvious to you that work out pretty well. Like you can take someone like Hana and just make her a priestess, where because like what Hana has going for her, she has a ton of strength and a ton of speed, but she has paper defenses. So you can just lean into that and make her a player phase unit who has some like side support utility. Um, didn't they just say that staff EXP is garbage on a lunatic? She joins at level four. Oh, I'd know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go through Shrine Maiden. No, it's like oh, once just, she's oh, promoted, you can move over there. Her and then, yeah. Oh my God, promoting Hana. Okay. Yeah. I mean, good luck. Uh, good luck is what I would say. Um. I mean, it's birthright. You can do whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, I wouldn't use her in Rev at all. She's much better. Yeah, worse. a lot of a lot of characters just like randomly have random. Like, there's a lot of. A lot more like overlap with classes in birthright and a lot of birthright classes um or at least class sets tend to have at least one absolute banger of a skill and also have some kind of either weapon overlap or weapon type or weapon like damage like damage type overlap so like magical to magical physical to physical like overlap so like you can probably justify it like on a reasonable number of units. I guess you could Caden <laughs> renewal on Caden turn him into a turn him into a turn him into a great master. Yeah. Wait, does Caden have a Zama friendship? No, he has it in his base class. No, he has Diviner. He has Diviner. Oh my bad. Yeah, I mean he does get he, oh, he does get even Zama. better, which is basically the same thing. So. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to that later. True. Even better and renewal. Man, now we're talking. Get him a friendship with Keaton to get uh, better odds. No, that doesn't work that way. You can't get All you right. can't get the wolf skin skills from friendship or partnership. True. Tra that's that's the real tragedy. Get like half your HP recovered every turn. Yeah, it would be fun. Okay. Well, then you would just be using Kana with the dragon stones at that point. Um. Let's move on to counter magic. Counter magic is even more niche than counter, but it has like like this is this is just extreme favoritism. But it has a slight bit of easier access because you get it on Kumagera, and um, like Kumagera is just one of those units that you're gonna wanna, gonna wanna capture because he has three like hard to access skills and he's got good stats. Like not capturing Kumagera is just a dumb thing to do because why would you not do it? Because you don't want to take. Because you don't, don't want to take Niles all the way over there in Chapter Fourteen. Yeah, it's not like you're going to be already going seventy-five percent of the way over there to get a chest or something. No. Anyway, it does. Uh, counter magic reflects all magical damage, uh, regardless of range. So this is all damage at one range. This is all magical damage regardless of range. Uh, Basically, the reason I want to talk a bit more about counter magic is to make sure that people know how to deal with it uh, when it's on enemies. If an enemy has counter and counter magic, attack them at two range with physical weapons. So that means daggers, hand axes, tomahawks, javelins, spears, kodachis, wakazashis, um, bows. Like you get the gist. Just make sure that's that's how you don't take damage back. Um, just that, that's just a PSA first of all. Um, other than that, counter magic is bad. Uh, like uh, it's just not that great i think i i would put it into like i i think i want to put it into bad straight up um if you want uh it's it's worse than counter just because it's just less applicable i guess um i don't particularly like either one um i'm not gonna argue that you shouldn't necessarily put counter magic higher than this but um i could see it anywhere between where it is now and right below counter Okay, I mean it's 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 three spaces, so yeah. it's it's not like it matters too much. 
Okay, uh, now that we're off of that skill, uh, we get to- th this- this part of the list is all- th this- like this- this entire ga except for- except for- you know what, let's do Warning Wheel first so we don't have to talk about it in the middle of this absolute banger squad. Um, let's, uh, warning Blow- okay, Warning Blow is- it's bad. Like, it already- uh, Warning Blow, it's- 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 it is consistent damage negation, but it's a level 15 promoted skill and it's only good against mages, only on player face. Why am I using it, right? What, what reason do I have? Like, I'm never happy to have Warding Blow. Eh, actually, there's parts in Rev where there's been, like, some really annoying, like, there's some Malignites in late game Rev that have no reason having stats as high as they do. And, like, having, like, I had Bolt knocking out of Sakura and she just did not take any damage on player phase and made it a lot easier to take them down. But other than that... Yeah, I would say it's like right below Duelist Blow. They're basically the same principle. It's like, on my player phase attack, I'm going to take less damage. Duelist Blow is chance-based. Warding Blow is a level 15 skill. Um, it does negate 20 damage, which is very significant. You can often just make the enemies tank you. Um, so that's nice. Um, and there are circumstances where, like, having warding blow can be useful um but it's in combination with like multiple other skills where you're like what you want to do is get your your warding get your unit into a position to support a bunch of units who are going to like attack like dual strike off of them or like otherwise do like a bunch of stuff on the player phase with them um like armored blow which we'll talk about later does essentially the same thing so the cases where where warding blow or armored blow will be nice is like you've got a unit who has uh one of those one or both of those skills and has auras like if they have inspiration and demoiselle and gentium or they have savage blow to weaken a bunch of the other enemies around or something where like you're not really using that unit as a as a main combat unit to deal a lot of damage, you're just trying to get them in a position to make everyone else around them a lot more effective on that player phase. Uh, so that that can be nice, but it's just not a huge effect, and probably warding blow is the least important part of that setup. Fair enough. Um, now we come to Rally Speed, and this might be the skill to finally dethrone insp uh, Inspiring Song. Um, rally Speed is plus 4 speed. Plus 4 speed. That's that's all I need to say. It's a level 5 uh, Falconite skill, so you get it on Shigure when you recruit him in like chapter 20, chapter 22, around that point you just get it for free. Um, it's one of the reasons why I like Shigure so much, because Rally Speed is just that good. Uh, it's just good. Like, you get it and you use it and you're gonna want it on at least one unit and regardless of what route you're on because of shigure and i guess selena if you want to be weird or azura if you want to be dumb uh you have access to rally speed pretty easily and i just think it's it's a it's a reasonably accessible skill it's good and it's early early enough for it to be relevant and by like plus four speed is always going to be good, but it's going to be more important the later on you go, because the later on you go, the bigger the numbers are that you need to hit to reach thresholds, so the plus 4 speed is going to be more important. Until then, the plus 3 speed from Inspiring Song can just serve as a good enough stopgap. Yeah, that's basically what I went over when we talked about Inspiring Song in the first place, was that plus 3 that you get from that in combination with things like Tonics and Pair Up are usually, is usually enough to carry you through the middle part of the game. But... Like you mentioned with like recruiting Shigure after an offspring seal will take him after an offspring seal will take him past level five um, and get him rally speed for free. Um, that's really nice. Um, you can get it in in birthright. You can get it on several uh, characters pretty easily. Um, and yeah, I think like half of the half of the royals have a Sky Knight as their free class. Uh, yes. Um, so, and like you said, yeah, it can be helpful to, to get online at that point in the game in conjunction with Inspiring Song if you really need to stack a lot of speed, or just because you need to get speed boosts on multiple characters at the same time. Inspiring Song is really something you get on one person for one turn. You, you can do more if you do some shelter shenanigans. Um, but Rally Speed will let you give it to a bunch of people 
all at the same time, and that's nice. Uh, I would still probably rate it a little bit lower than what you were suggesting. Um, I, I, I think... Yeah, I think it's... I kind of want to say it's not quite as good as Magic Plus 2. Um, I think you're putting too much faith, in, faith into Magic Plus 2, and I think you're not giving Rally Speed enough credit. Um, like, like yeah, I can I'm understand not... not putting it above Inspiring Song, but, like, putting it... Like, Sword Fair on... Is easy access on Ryoma... And it's not that he stacks as on Xander or Corin, which are the two other units that really like having the sword fair. Yes. I think that I think that rally speed is better than sword fair. Yeah. Okay. We can stick with this. That's fine. Air superiority. Uh, it's another one of the uh, family of skills that conditionally gives you a bunch of hit and avoid. So you know, underdog, air superiority, quixotic, certain blow. Air superiority's uh, condition is that you have to be in combat against another flyer. Which is pretty like, which is pretty apt considering the fact that it's for Kinchis and Kinchis have bows, which means that they like being against flyers. You're gonna see this active a lot, and it can make some some maps a lot, lot, lot easier. Like if you have like air superiority on a sniper, and they have like a mini bow <laughs> on chapter 24, <laughs> those uh, those enemies are not doing anything to that uh, sniper. Let me just tell you that much. I've done it with Niles. I've done it with Mozu, and it is it's it's. You will be surprised at how good it is. Um, but I still think that the fact that it's just level 5 promoted gives you a bunch of hit, gives you a bunch of avoid against any air unit, which are the kind of units that you're going to uh, like really benefit from using bows against them in the first place. Not to say that you're going to not be using bows against other units. I just think that it makes it a, like a nice-to-have skill. Like You're never going to turn it up. Um, yeah. You don't see enemy flyers and... In great concentrations very often um there's a like in birthright the one that immediately springs to mind is the one map towards the end of the game where they appear in the corners and you can set up the, the wind with oh wings. with with hans and you yeah. have to, oh my god that map is so bad <laughs> um where it's like you can put this on someone um and use it to help them fight the uh the flyers if you want to go out and attack them instead of just going straight to Hans. Um, in Conquest 24, uh, you can do a ton of work with it against all of the Falcon Knights and Kenshi Knights. Um, there are a couple paralogs that have flyers, like... Uh, Percy? Yeah, Percy's for sure, if you do it late, which I wouldn't normally recommend. Or um, Seedbirds has a bunch in the top left corner. Which can be kind of uh, annoying. I think Ophelia's has a couple in the bottom left too, right? Yes, yeah, Ophelia's has a bunch of wyvern riders in that corner. Um, it's it's never very necessary to have air superiority, um, but it, it can certainly um, make a unit a lot more effective against many flyers at the same time. Like you can you can yeah, drive down their hit rates pretty do... low. If you can manage to properly do air superiority uh, shining bow, the, you will never be hurt by a flyer for the rest of your life, basically. Yeah, although you have to keep in mind that shining bow has its own tw minus twenty avoid penalty. So. Oh yeah, but still, like you're in sniper, which is a pretty decent class on its own, and then you're probably using this on like Niles, who already has like a bunch of speed, and then you know air superiority gives thirty avoid to balance out the minus twenty avoid to give ten. It's it's basically that, and you're probably going to be in sniper at that point, which has decent enough defense. To, like what I'm saying is that you can make it work. Yeah. Um. So a niche skill, I think, definitely. Just looking at this list. Um. I think it's better than Rend Heaven, for sure, and probably more than Replicate, honestly. Um, and Shove. Yeah, I think that's fair. Alright, in part one you kept talking about how you like the uh, healing skills, so I'll let you talk about probably one of the more powerful area healing skills, Amaterasu. Yeah, uh, Amaterasu is... It's, it's cool. It's, uh... Two tile radius, heal everything around you for 20%. Um, 
you know, there's not much to dislike about it. It's area renewal. Um, it doesn't affect the unit who has it, unfortunately. And you also can't stack it. So, like, if you have two different units next to each other who both have it, then they don't heal everyone around them for 40. They, they just get 20%. Um, oh, wow. Can you stack it with uh, Azura's personal healing desk? Yes. Um, although I, I wouldn't recommend ever doing that. There's no... Don't, don't train... Uh, Azura through Sky Knight at all. It's not worth it. Well, I mean, I'm just saying that you have Azura in the same area as somebody yes. that's also somebody that's... Yes. Uh, but I wouldn't go out of way to, out of my way to put it on Azura herself. Um, yeah, it, it's just... It's it's a convenient thing that just speeds things up. Um, I really like using Kenshi Knights. I think they're a very powerful class. They're a class that relies on having good innate stats. Like, if you have someone with kind of weak bases... You don't want to... Kenshi Knight's promotion you, is just not good. Yeah. You, but if you have the good stats to make it work. Yeah. Um, but if you do have the stats to make it worth, work, then it's very, very powerful. And what what Amaterasu does for you is it lets that unit... Like, the whole purpose of a Kenshi Knight is to be a great player phase unit. And this skill lets them support a bunch of other units alongside them much better. Like, you already want to send in your Kenshi Knight, kill something, and then dual strike off of them. And now everyone who joins in gets free healing after that, the next turn. Mm -hmm. my, my, my main only real issue is that it's 20% healing as a level 15 promoted skill, and also your Kenshi Knight is probably going to have a ton of movement, so catching up with them is not super easy. So you might have you, you might see, like, ending up gimping their movement. But I, I don't think that's too much of an issue. It's just something worth mentioning, mm -hmm. at least. Yeah, so most of the time the best partners for your Kenshi Knights will be either other Kenshi Knights or Wyverns, just other Flyers, really. Um, just because, like you said, they're the ones who can keep up the best. Um, yeah. But to take Also, a I just want to point out something. Like, with, 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 with Falcon Knight and Kenshi Knight, they were trying with these skills. Like, Rally Speed is pretty good, Warding Blow is kind of crap. We're gonna probably put the uh, Amaterasu somewhere around niche, and same with uh, same with Air Superiority. But then for Wyvern Lord, they were just like, "Fuck this! Let's just give them a bunch of good skills." Uh, I, I have a like I don't know what they were thinking, but I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, they they did really load up on good Wyvern skills. Um, but to continue with the example of Chapter Twenty Four and Conquest, um, Wyvern Lords and Malignites don't have great matchups there, naturally, because um, it's hard for them to just like straight up, well, you can Brave Axe a, a Falcon Knight down or something. And a lot of times you can stack enough damage to just kill one hit too. Um, but yeah, they- And also, uh, I think most, a lot of the enemies also have air superiority. Right? Yes, they do. And that's that. kind of a problem for them. Um, but like a couple of Wyverns supported by a Kenshi can do really well because the Kenshi Knight's dual strikes are going to be awesome with effective damage and they're going to have their own air superiority. Um, and then you get the, the hit bonus from attack stance on the on the lead. So if you send in your Kenshi first and then you have your Wyverns follow up off of them, um, then you can still hit things pretty reliably and, and just crush the map without ever taking attacks, which is pretty fun. Um, you were thinking this would go in niche um i'd be tempted to put it a little higher and oh yeah that, that was just like that was just a quick yeah uh, quick rating like uh, i think about it i think it's a bit better yeah um looking at the list now that we've got a bunch of skills here there are more decisions to make like, um i i could see like anywhere between right above seal defense and right above profiteer and it sort of depends on how much you value some of those the seal skills in between and how much you value things like um, i want to put it gentium or poison that. strike yeah yeah i want to put it below poison strike above strike. actually you know what i'm gonna put it above poison strike okay okay oh i i'm talking about certain blow for a year I love certain blow. I love everything about it. Like you could, you could, you, I, I would, I would, I could spend a year talking about it, and I wouldn't be done with it. It's just so good. Forty hit people. This, this is, this is so much hit that you will never be worrying about how much hit you have on player face. And this is on an 
archer. I mean, this is a sniper skill. You get this at level 5 promoted. You can rush this before chapter 17 and just tell the ninjas to go fuck off. And it's just so good. It's so good. It's you can take any weapon. Like you can take a you can take a sidelong Yumi, which has like what 65 hit or something. That that becomes a 100 hit weapon in the hands of an archer because it's not just a 40 hit from the certain blow. It's also the 10 hit that snipers have innately, and also the fact that bows already have good hit. You are never going to see bad hit rates when you use certain blow, and guaranteeing stuff in Fire Emblem is good. If you are able to guarantee do good damage, then that's good. Certain blow, quick draw, skill plus two, bow fair. All of these skills have like one thing. Good hit rate, good damage on player face. And it's it's a theme that's consistent, it works to, it works well, and I just think that it's a great I think it's a great skill. I think I would I would put certain blow into meta defining one hundred times out of one hundred. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, and it's for the same reasons I mentioned with something like Quixotic, where you usually can just like get the appropriate matchups, especially if you're using forged bronze weapons as much as you can. Um, you, you can get most of the hit you want to have. Um, Certain Blow is very, very nice though. It can definitely like it solidifies your it, it makes your your plans very, very consistent. Like you can, you can know I'm going to send in my certain blow unit and go kill something, and you know that that enemy's going to be dead, and potentially you know that like their dual strikes are going to be amazingly accurate, and you can rely on those as well on player phase. Um, I also think you might be slightly undervaluing the fact that it means that you can use any weapon. Because some, there are some other bows that you want to be using, right? Like uh, you can you can reasonably like justify using a killer bow as a sniper because you get some crit bonus and stuff. Um, it might not always help, but it, it, it sometimes there's some like pretty tough like against generals that have a uh, uh, wary fighter. Then that extra crit is going to be really helpful because you can deal more damage. Yeah, especially that, considering that, that, that is one of the few fighter. situations where I think the four times crit multiplier on killer weapons is actually useful, where you can't double and. Like, you might be able to hit them for, like, 12 or 15 damage. And depending on where you are in the game, that might be enough to crit, to kill with a 4 times crit. Um, yeah, I, I, if it were up to me alone, I would say this is, um, is it better than Darting Blow? Hmm, I think probably not. Uh, there, there are units that like getting certain blow that aren't snipers. Um, like one fun thing you can do is is make, uh, like take Effie and send her through sniper by friendship with Mozu. Um, and then you can you have the choice where you can either stick with bow classes, and like make her a sniper for the rest of the game or like go from sniper to Kenshi Knight or go to Kenshi Knight immediately or whatever. Um, but you can also take it over to like back to great Take her back to Great Knight and have her be like a the unit who kills things with Brave Lance all the time, um, or yeah, you can like that's another thing you can do with like the Chapter Sixteen Berserkers that have a certain blow or Kumagera. You can just give him a Tomahawk and kill Chapter Seventeen. Certain blow is the Chapter Seventeen killer, by the way. Um, well, I don't think more so than just having like a good bow unit or a good Shuriken unit. <laughs> But yes, it, it can make for like some very easy kills on, on ninjas in chapter 17. Oh yeah, but I mean like in terms of like ready-made. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of ready-made units that come with certain blow that just absolutely destroy Yeah, them. some of the captures with it are very nice for that. Um, I was going to continue with Effie for a moment. The other thing you can do is like, you, you can stick with the archer tree. You can go back to her home tree and go to Great Knight. Um, you can also make her a... Or a, a certain blow berserker herself. She won't have the weapon rank to get to Brave Axe unless you just dump a bunch of arm scrolls on her, but um, she's obscenely powerful as a berserker, and like having certain blow with that is really entertaining. Um, yeah, but I, I think where I come down on this is it's, I would put it right below Darting Blow, because it's, it's a similar kind of thing where it gives you 
substantially better player phase attacks. Um, although one thing to be said is certain blow applies for dual strikes and something like darting blow doesn't. Um, oh, uh, here we go. I have my uh, I, ha I have a, I have a screenshot. Sorry, you were talking about Berserker Effie. Uh, level twelve Berserker Effie, fifty one strength. Just just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> just a screenshot from a run that I did. Yeah, that, that's with some boosts, I'm sure, because I think her strength cap is forty three. Oh yeah, that's but, that's with an Arthur uh, that's with an Arthur back yeah. and a, a tonic and whatnot. Um, but yeah, um, she's pretty funny. Um, so actually thinking about it a little bit more. Uh, I would say, just it. Why is Darting Blow below Rally Luck? Can we can we just uh, agree to swap those two? Mm, I'm not so much sure I would actually. I I, I kind of like Rally like Rally Luck where it is. I think people do under underappreciate the four dodge four hit. Yeah, but like this is an entire doubling threshold. On oh, a player phase attack. Yeah, but I mean on like on player phase is again. If you're if you need to do it on enemy face, then like you're probably like using that unit a lot, and you probably should be actually just at that point just putting speed boosters into them. But like this is good for um, hitting thresholds earlier on without investment or benching a unit, bringing them back. So there's a lot of th I think there's a lot of things you can do with darting blow. Hmm. Um, well, if you want to switch them, that's okay. Um, I disagree, but I'm. I'm not going to fight yeah, you. I'm willing to keep them this way. Um, okay, so I'm thinking, to me, Certain Blow is like one of those things that's right above Magic Plus 2. Okay. Uh, th uh, I, okay, this is where you would put Certain Blow. This is where I would put Certain Blow. Okay, that's that's kind of a lie. I would probably put Certain Blow... I'd probably put Certain Blow right here. But uh, I, I think splitting the difference is definitely going to work out more in my favor than your favor. <laughs> Um, but can we, uh, like, can we agree so, uh, at least be, be willing to put it above sword fair? Okay. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Speaking of fair enough, let's come to our, uh, final, oh, wait, no, we have axe fair still. This is our second to last fair skill, yeah, that, bow fair. Bow fair is... That's the trick. There are, the, there's all these skill categories where they have, like, five representatives on the Hoshiden side and one on Nor, or vice versa. Um, I mean, to be fair, we have five breaker skills in Nora and one in Hoshido, yep. so yeah, uh, it goes both ways. Uh, anyways, Bowfair is, I think it's a fine skill. I, I think, I think a lot, of, I think the entire Archer to Sniper class line, it's very coherent. Mm -hmm. It's a very consistent message. It, it has one thing that it does and it does it really well. And I just think that it, I like it, especially for a newcomer, because like, a lot of times when you go into fates, it can be kind of weird because a lot of these units are super different. Like, you can't just, in, in let's say, in FE7, right, final 7, you can do a lot of things with Urk that you can just do. A lot of things you can do with Urk, you can just do with Lucius. A lot of, um, or, like, a lot of things you can do with, uh, a lot of things you can do with, uh, a lot of things you can do with Raven, you can just do with Harkin. Um, as long as they're both trained around the same level. Uh, but in Fates, you can't... The things you do with Odin, you definitely can't do with Nyx without a lot of investment. The things you do with Lazo, you can't really do with Selena. Like, it's, it's, it's very different in that way. And I think that it's very nice for a newcomer to be able to look at a class and tell, I know exactly what it is this class does, and it's very transparent, and I don't need to put too much into this unit, uh, any unit that's in this class, to make them do what they're supposed to do. That's 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 just what that's just what I wanted to say about the design of Archer and Sniper. But before we talk about the skill itself, I think it's a nice skill. I think I'd put it between Lance Fair and Tome Fair. Yeah, my thought was right below Tome Fair, where it's like it's not quite as effective as Tome Fair when used in the best way, but it also like it coheres, like you said, very well with the other skills you're going to have by the time you get to Bow Fair, and it just makes like a very solid unit who's going to be constantly useful. Um. Basically, if you get to Bowfair, you're you're going to stick with Sniper or Kenshi Knight. Uh, there are other bow classes, but they're essentially just worse Sniper or worse Kenshi. Like Bow Knight, you'd basically just rather get the flying uh, Merchant. It's just like a slower Sniper. Yeah, Priestess. Now that's a class. Priestess is a thing. Um, you can do that if you want. Unfortunately, it caps out at B bows, so you can't like do break bow priestess or something. Crescent, Crescent bow, bow but, yes. Uh, I mean, at that point, you can. Pro I mean, shining bow is probably what you're going for if you're going priestess. Mm -hmm. 
And alas, neither of those um, bows are in Birthright. Much yeah. to the, much to my chagrin, because I'd love to do Shining and Shining Bow Sakura. And you can't really do, uh, and you can't really do uh, sh Shining Bow Niles and Priestess because you can't get Priestess. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I think that's a fair price. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with it. So I, I guess we got um, two more skills for uh, Nine Tails, and then that'll wrap it up for the Hoshiden side. Can we just can we just can we just take better odds? Uh, uh, can we just take better odds and put it with even better? Because like for for the damage dealing skills, I can understand why you would put one above the uh, like one above the other. But like even then, they're at the same spot. Yeah. So actually, it's the same relationship, but in reverse. So for even better, it's better than better odds because. It only applies on the starting on the second turn, so so even better is that right, slight bit better turn, as a skill than that, yeah, so better odds. However, um, Nine Tails is a worse class than Wolf Signer. Um, yeah, Wolf Signer is a stupidly strong class. Um, yeah, like so, Wolf Signer has great pair bonuses. It actually has really solid combat for a unit that is foot locked and one range locked. Uh, Valoria is notably better than Keaton, be mainly because Keaton's skill is kind of bad, which he can normally make up for with the Beast Stone, but he has trouble using the Beast Rune accurately, so he doesn't get... I wouldn't even say that. I think it's really just weapon rank. Getting the B rank on Keaton is a struggle. Yeah, and that's a combination of... Well, mainly it's down to the fact that a lot of times people use him as a pure backpack, so he just doesn't see enough combat to get weapon rank that way. Um, stone rank isn't that important because unfortunately like, you, you get to C rank, which I think all of the beast units come with by default, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Caden uh, might have like high D. Caden has C rank. Caden uh, has C rank. Okay. Um, so you're going to come with C rank, so that means you get the plus one bonus for getting C rank, and then the, the thing they get at B rank is just five hit, which is nice. Oh, I was actually talking about uh, Beast Stone Plus. Oh, to get to the Beast Stone Plus. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, the way I see I mean, it's like, like the, you know we were talking about Keaton's hit rates. Well, the funny thing about that, uh, Beast Stone Plus is... 12 might, 90 hit, gives 8 skill and 6 speed, so it kind yeah, of helps he, out Yeah, he that. does fine with that. It's just, like you said, like he doesn't see enough combat to get there normally. Um, Valoria sort of can, just because he's like much more efficient at using the Beast Rune to see a lot of enemy phase combat if you want to do that. Um, and also you can auto level. Yes, you can also just get it range. late, and it should be either almost there or already at B rank. Um... I guess I'll continue my point about the actual benefits of the weapon ranks directly, which is uh, at B you get 5 hit, and with most weapon, well, with every weapon type actually, that also gives you plus 1 damage when you have uh, weapon triangle advantage, but stones don't have weapon triangle advantage on anything, so you never get that benefit. So it's it's just 1 damage at C rank, 1 hit at, uh, or 5 hit at B rank, and then 1 damage and 5 hit more at A rank, and then another one damage and five hit at S rank, I believe, um, which you're pretty much never going to get to with a beast unit. Um, so that's not really that relevant to this skill discussion, but I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's like nice to have. It's just like renewal. Yeah, it's essentially equivalent to renewal. I think. Um, worst distribution and I would probably I would take the 20% every turn over the 40% every other turn although sometimes it works out so that you're not taking damage or not taking significant damage on every turn and you can get it to line up so that you you're really getting the most out of that 40% healing every other turn um but yeah th this it, it's a nice skill to have you can basically get it for free on like Selkie or Valoria just from Offspring Seals. Uh, it's right there, I think, right under Renewal. And this in this case, I think it's just objectively true that better odds is, or that, that odd shaped is better than even handed. Um, I just, we just discussed how technically even better is better than better odds because of the timing of the yeah, healing. Yeah, you just get more. But 
the the count the counter argument to that is actually that wolf Signer is just a better class it tanks more it gets more out of this kind of healing because they can actually see more combat um so you could you could put them in either order but i would tuck them both right under renewal yeah i think i think I think I think we don't care. I think the audience doesn't care. I think we should just move on. Okay. Uh, so I think we, we'll hit Grizzly Wound and then we'll wrap up this segment and we'll come back for our part three with the, uh, the promoted Norian skills. Oh yeah, we're just, yeah. At this point, yeah, I gotta go to bed soon too. Man, this has been a long set of videos. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, but mm. uh, de definitely, definitely very long. Happy to see Locke touch the salon top. <laughs> uh, let's, let's move that, That's on to still funny movie. to me, but I, I guess I can't exactly argue against it. I mean... It, <laughs> yeah, I, I really have pushed it in a... In a I pushed a rhetoric that makes us that arguing against Locke touch is just the wrong thing to do. <laughs> and honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. Fair enough. All right. Uh, Grizzly Wound. Grizzly Wound is both uh, Ninetales and Wolf Segner, level 15. It's... 20% damage, uh, 20% max HP after any combat you take. Um, this is another one of those poison strike type skills, except way worse because you get it way later. This is a level f level. Uh, this is a level 10 pro unpromoted skill. This is a level 15 promoted skill, and um, basically, Grizzly Wound is actually there is one. There is actually a point to be made here is that Grizzly Wound actually shows up quite often on. Well, not quite often. It just show up occasionally. Uh, and often enough that you should like take note of it on enemies in conquest um and these are enemies that also come with poison strike there's a movement plus one poison strike grizzly wound lock touch master ninja in chapter 17 that you always want to capture because that man is an absolute legend um he will he will just he will just make enemies wish they weren't alive uh but other than that grizzly wound i just don't it's just not that great of a skill um it's kind of funny how Grizzly Wound is one of those skills where it's like, okay, Keaton can get it, Caden can get it, their children can get it, uh, the children of whoever they're married to can get it, uh, and then a bunch of generics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Grizzly Wound it's... is basically a, a late game, maybe slightly souped up version of Steel Defense. Uh, it has essentially the same effect. It's like, I mean, it's you didn't? it's quite literally a souped-up version of Poison Strike, though. Well, but the difference is it applies on enemy phase, so... Well, that's what I mean, it's souped up. Yeah, well, so what I'm thinking about is what it actually does for you once it applies. I guess so. Where basically it knocks off like 6, 7, 8, 9 HP from an enemy that you weren't able to kill on enemy phase who attacked you. Um, and that's okay. Uh... It's really not very important by the time you get this, though. So, so it's kind of like what seal defense and seal speed do for you. Probably a slightly stronger effect, but with much less overall I, usage. I would highly, I would, I would, I would highly contest the fact that it's better than seal speed because, again, seal speed is level. No, I wouldn't say it's better than it. them. Um, it, it's it's. Like, its effect is slightly stronger, but it, it just doesn't get nearly as many up. You can't use it very well, here. basically. I think I think putting it around here is fine. Um, yeah, I think that's okay. Um, like, like, right next to Seal Res is actually something I like. It's one of those things where, like, Seal Res has a specific thing that it can help you with. Um, and it, it's not very important, but it helps for a long time. And... Grizzly Wound is a little bit stronger, but it just doesn't get nearly as much use. Wow. All right. Well, that's uh, that's going to be it for part two. Uh, before we end this, I want to point out that the top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. The top eleven spots have not changed since part one and part two. Nope. But we're moving on to the Norian promoted skills, and these are some absolutely nasty skills. Um, I have a feeling we're gonna see maybe, probably not too much movement, but we're gonna see us like at least a little bit of movement in that area, um, or at least I hope we do. I mean, I can tell you, Trample's gonna make some waves, Defender's gonna make some waves. Um, hopefully, we get to see Life Taker make some waves, but I have a feeling that's not going to. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I think there's at least one thing coming up that I would probably stick up in the, the top tier, but we'll get to that next time. Yeah, uh, well, thank you guys for watching. If you did, uh, leave a like. Uh, subscribe if you want to see more. Put, leave a comment if you want to see anything unique. Uh, we all know what the bell does by now. I'll see you guys in part three. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.